Mitchell Englander. I'm joined by my colleagues, Council Member Harris Dawson, and as well as Bob Blumenfield. And uh, we have a quorum, so we'll go ahead and get started. I've got um, colleagues a couple of a uh, few items on consent that I would like to consider. Um, items seven, eleven, and twelve. We do have speakers on item seven, but I'm ready to take that on consent unless you are dying to speak. Did you wish to waive your time? Okay, no, don't wish to speak on item seven. Okay, then we can go ahead and take items seven, eleven, and twelve on consent without objection, then that'll be the order. On item three, we're gonna go ahead and continue item three. Item four, I also have, and we're gonna continue it to a date uncertain at this time. Item four, I have a request for a continuation until June 12th. We do have two speakers uh, that had filled out cards, both the applicant um, I believe as well as the representative on item four, but we're going to continue that. Did you still wish to speak? If you're still here, no longer here. Okay. And we'll go ahead and continue that as well. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. For item four, did you have a date certain? Item four, June 12th. Thank you. Item one, uh, I'm also joined by council member Price. Item one, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, receive and file the director's report for now. Let's go ahead and take then the next item, item eight, out of order. <clears throat> now item eight, I do have uh, a number of speaker cards as well as the applicant owner and the applicant representative. Did you wish to speak or did you wish for us to take up the item? Did you want to comment on? And then we also have an appellant. Mr. Chair, could we call item eight in order? There are a number of speakers on the way. Um, we're taking item eight right now, and it's 2.37. We're already seven minutes past the scheduled time of this meeting. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I have a number of handouts that I would like to uh, Chair. pass to the sergeant. You are the applicant? I am the appellant. If you can speak into the uh, microphone. I'm sorry, I'm the, the appellant. The appellant. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, we're going to start with, um, that's fine. We can start with the appellant. I don't have a problem with that. That's, that's yeah. I'd rather let the applicant. The applicant? Yes. Thank okay. You. Thank we'll you, we'll start with the applicant then. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with the applicant. Yeah, if you can go ahead and read item eight into the record. Sure. Um, item eight, Councilman, this is an appeal filed by the Palms Elementary Family Association. It relates to uh, the categorical exemption for the density bonus project. It's a 42 dwelling unit project that includes affordable housing in CD5. Uh, Council Member Englander, Terry Kaufman, Mesilla City Attorney's Office. Uh, you should take the staff presentation first before speakers. Okay, we can go ahead and do that. We'll do a brief overview. All right, good afternoon, council members. Connie Chow with the planning department. And as mentioned that today before you is an appeal of a determination for the California Environmental Quality Act under case number ENV 2016-4881-CE. The project is located at 3568 Motor Avenue in the Palms Mar Vista Del Rey Community Plan and is adjacent to the Palms Elementary School. The project involves the demolition of an existing commercial building and the construction of a new six-story, 72-foot tall mixed-use development containing 42 units, four of which are for very low income and 1,700 square feet of ground floor retail. On September 1st, 2017, the planning department determined that the project qualifies for a categorical exemption from CEQA under state and city CEQA guidelines. The project meets the criteria of the Class 4 Category 1 CE for grading and the Class 32 CE for an infill project. The CE was issued alongside the density bonus determination, case number DIR 2016-4880-DB, and the case had a 15-day appeal period ending on September 17, 2017, 
and no appeals were filed. However, later in December 14th of 2017, an appeal was filed by the Palms, fam uh, the Palms Elementary Family Association comprised of students, parents, and teachers against the CEQA determination for the case. Um, as provided in the council file, the project meets all the requirements and therefore qualifies for the class 32 and class four exemptions. The applicant has submitted to the council file um, technical studies by experts for air quality, noise, phase one and two site assessments, all of which confirm no environmental impacts. The applicant has also submitted additional documentation for the project to be considered as a sustainable communities project under state public resources code section 21155.1 adopted as part of Senate Bill 375. Under this state law, projects that are determined to be a transit priority project and meet environmental land use and public benefit criteria as required by the state are determined to be a sustainable communities project and are statutorily exempt from CEQA. Planning has submitted a report dated May 14th, 2018, outlining the justification for the exemption with the additional analysis for transit, SCAG consistency, and the previously mentioned technical studies. Uh, planning recommends that city council deny the CEQA appeal and determine that the project is categorically exempt from CEQA with a class four and class 32 CE, and also determine that the project is a transit priority project and sustainable communities project and is therefore statutorily exempt from CEQA per public resources code section 21155.1. That concludes our presentation. We're available for any questions. Great, thank you very much. Now we'll go ahead and hear from the applicant, Mr. Dana Sales. Councilmember Englander, Terry Kaufman, Macias. Um, one thing to add is um, the exemptions under the state CEQA guidelines, Article 19, or sections 15304 and 15332. Got it. Thank you. Have memorized. Good tutelage. Counselors, oh, um, my name is Elisa Pastor. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, uh, 3568 Motor LLC, the applicant and the property owner. Um, first of all, we appreciate all of the work that staff has done on this matter, and we agree with the staff presentation and urge you to deny the appeal and to adopt the sustainable communities exemption um, and the existing CE. So the applicant is building 42 new units of housing something that is sorely needed in this community. Four of those units will be affordable units. This project is replacing an old grocery store here. Um, and we're gonna be housing individuals and very low, low income individuals. This project is located with half a mile of the Palm Station. Um, and it's exactly the kind of project that, that our planning department has been pushing with its local initiatives for transit oriented development. Now, this project is statutorily exempt from CEQA, which means that we don't have to do any more CEQA studies, we don't have to do any more analysis. But even so, our client understands that there's a lot of emotions here and that the community wants answers. And so what we've done is that we have undertaken multiple expert reports to satisfy the community and basically to be a good neighbor. Um, you're gonna hear a lot of hyperbole about the impacts of this project. Um, and the committee and the public deserve to hear the facts. These are the facts. Our reports show that there is no soil contamination. We did a phase one and a phase two. Anything in that regard is totally speculative. We did um, extensive air quality analysis and we showed that this project is gonna meet the air quality thresholds of the South Coast Air Quality Management District, even for sensitive receptors. We know that we're gonna comply with all of the noise requirements. We're gonna require, um, comply with the city's noise requirements. We're also gonna com comply with LAUSD's noise requirements, which are actually more strict than the city's requirements. Um, and these expert reports that, you know, appellant may talk about today, they're not actually based on any real data. Um, the previous reports submitted were just all speculation. So our client has got, uh, gone above and beyond, and the real reason we're here today is because there is a disgruntled neighborhood group. The disgruntled neighborhood group who asked for our client to basically give them a payout in perpetuity. Before that time, we had a seven to zero vote at the Land Use Committee for the Neighborhood Council. 
So we've also been working really closely with LAUSD on this project. There are folks from LAUSD who are here um, to answer any of your questions should you have them, and if you'd like to call them up, they'd be happy to come speak. Um, we've listened and we've um, responded to many of their requests. We're only going to do excavation and shoring when school is out. Um, we're going to put up a 12-foot minimum sound barrier during construction. We're going to install an 8-foot new wall, and we're giving $500,000 to the school district to relocate a kindergarten playground and to relocate um, some classrooms for the deaf and hard of hearing. Now these classrooms as they exist today have very little insulation and we're going to be paying for significant insulation to be put in so the conditions are actually going to be far better than what they are today. Of course we're going to comply with all of the dust and noise regulations. AQMD sets out some pretty strict rules about um, dust and dewatering, not dewatering, watering the site down and all of those things that will follow during construction. Um, we're going to make sure that there's no loading and unloading of construction vehicles um, when school is coming in and out. So we could build a buy right project. We could come back tomorrow with a different project and build a buy right project. But we believe in this project. We believe that providing housing for this community is very important. And providing affordable housing for our community is important. Again, we worked closely with LAUSD. We have gone above and beyond what almost any developer would do, especially for this size project. And we respectfully request that you deny the appeal and adopt the sustainable communities exemption. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that somebody here is from LAUSD. Is there yes. so, there's somebody here from LAUSD? Um, okay, if we can ask them then to come up and just keep it brief and say a few words. Council Member Englander, uh, you probably should take the appellant first and then hear from the school district. Yeah, I wanted to keep it consistent people. though. And so if we could, and then I'll go back to the appellant. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, hello everybody, my name is Gwen Godek. I'm the CEQA advisor for Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, the developer has provided all of the uh, technical environmental studies that they've done on this site. And we have in-house experts for air quality uh, lead and asbestos, uh, PCBs, pest management, all of those things. And these reports were reviewed by those in-house experts and we found no red flags. Uh, we concur that the impacts to the school will be less than significant. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, go to the appellant now, Mr. Orange. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to uh, pass these handouts along to the Sergeant at Arms uh, for your review as well as inclusion in the record. Mr. Chair, we have had as parents, teachers, and students, community members, many of whom just walked into the room absolutely no notice of this project until just before Thanksgiving of last year. When we had that notice, the very first thing we did was try to reach out and find out who was doing the project, what we could do to learn more about it, and we have been excluded from the process involving the project at every turn. By everyone that we have asked to hear us, we have been excluded. We then found out that the city's own documents say that this project is going to expel into the air carcinogenic chemicals, PM particulate matter uh, 10 and 2.5 particles, as well as volatile organic compounds, reactive organic gases, and other carcinogens. And we had no notice of this affecting our children and our teachers, and as soon as we found out about it, we commissioned our own expert report. That report, which you have in our appeal, says that the cancer risk to the children is in excess of 27 times the SCAQMD uh, legal minimums, or excuse me, legal maximums. Um, so of course that concerned us. So we looked into it further and took every action that we could, and we ended up here. And now, five days prior to this hearing, the developer filed 1,800 pages in the record of new studies and information and a request for a new exemption. In that request for a new exemption and new studies and information, 
the developer admits that there would be a significant impact on the environment that cannot be mitigated. And that is why there's got to be excavation when the kids aren't there. Now, our question becomes, how in the world was it possible for the developer scientists, the city scientists, and everybody who was supposed to protect our children to miss that? Why are we now, five days prior to the hearing, finding out that, aha, there is something that can't be mitigated as far as harm? And if you look at the developer's studies, which we have only had five business days with, what you see is that as far as noise goes, the developer takes a noise sample out on the side of Motor Avenue, and he establishes that as the baseline that you can't exceed five decibels above under city code. And then he goes into the block, into the interior portion of the block where a classroom is, and says, well, the ambient noise factor isn't going to be five decibels above the baseline noise level. Well, the baseline noise level wasn't from inside the block where the classroom is. The baseline noise level was sampled outside on the side of the road with traffic. That's in their study. That is a flaw. We have not had time to cite other flaws because we just got it. But another flaw is that the LAUSD's own school upgrade project says that a bulldozer, for example, has a decibel level of 85 decibels, but the developer study says it's 64.2 decibels. And he uses that number to say that the construction noise won't come in above what is allowed. I say all of this to say that, again, the planning department is missing these flaws. Again, the developer is trying to perpetrate these flaws upon us without us having an opportunity to examine them. So what we're asking for, and all we're asking for, is an EIR, the opportunity to have a draft EIR so that we can pay for some scientists to take a look at it and tell us that our kids are safe. And if those scientists take a look at it and they say our kids aren't safe, then we'll come back and we'll say, well, what can we do to make our kids safe? How can we have this project built? It's got to be built. That's fine. But how can we do it in a way so that the kids are safe, so that the teachers are safe? And the EIR process is what's supposed to ensure that. But here we've done it backwards. They skipped right on by it, and now they want to give you some tests and say, oh, everything's fine. But actually it wasn't. That's not how it's supposed to work. All we ask is for an opportunity to examine the facts. Okay, thank you very much. We also have a number of speakers on this item. Elissa Pastor, followed by Rob Renshaw, and anybody can come up whenever they're ready. Or at least, already, I'm sorry, you already went already. Rob Renshaw, John Taxaw, Scott Oyster. How are you doing? And if you could just state your name for the record. Sure. John Taxa. Thank you for the time. Um, I'm a local real estate professional uh, in the Palms area. Uh, I really am in favor of this project. I think uh, we need more housing in close proximity to major transit uh, stops. I also think uh, having additional housing in the area is much needed. Uh, especially for some affordable housing, which this project has. I believe uh, you know, it's great news to hear that the owner is investing $500,000 uh, with LAUSD to move the kindergarten um, and some classrooms. I think they're showing their dedication to the project and uh, resolving any issues. I'm very much in favor of the project. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for uh, giving me a, a minute to speak. I'm Rob Renshaw. I am a local resident and uh, just wanted to express my support for the project. Uh, I, I think one of the things that's uh, clear is the, the lack of housing in the area. Palms is an area that's growing rapidly. Um, I, I notice this on a daily basis and uh, the fact that you know a quality project like this will be in a much needed location adding 42 housing units to 
a, a very supply constrained area, I think is critical. And uh, if the, the proper steps are taken to ensure the safety of the students at the school, I'm all in favor of it. I have two young daughters. If they were uh, students at this school, I would certainly want to ensure that they were protected. And I feel that the steps that are being taken by uh, the developer uh, are doing just that. And uh, the financial investment in the school seems to show a, a very big commitment that uh, I think is very important. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Reverend Clarence Moore. I'm president on the uh, Minister's Pastors Forum, and I'm here to urge you to support this project, uh, 3568 uh, Motor Avenue. Um, uh, housing is critical in the city of, of L.A., and um, 42 units, 10% uh, of them will be low income. Um, so I'm here to support you and urge you to, to, uh, to uh, approve this project. Thank you. Hi, my name is Scott Oser. I'm a resident of the area, and I want to express my strong support for 3568 Motor Avenue. Um, as a lot of the speakers have said already before me, this project is going to benefit all of us who live, work, and visit the Palms community by creating jobs, generating millions of tax dollars for the local economy, and creating much-needed housing in Los Angeles, including affordable housing for low-income families, which is very important in the housing crisis that we're currently in. Um, they are investing in the students in Palms Elementary, donating $500,000 um, out of an abundance of generosity. That's something that they're not required to do. That's something that they're doing out of generosity for the school and for the students. Um, I appreciate that the project team has done their due diligence on the project site. Third-party companies have already conducted studies to reveal that the soil is safe and the project noise levels will be below thresholds. LA needs more housing, more affordable housing. This is what we need for the future. Thank you. Good afternoon, Good afternoon everyone. William Shimmerman. I live about a block and a half from the proposed development site, so I'm about as local as it can get. There's a mixed-use project that's on the opposite corner that went up a few years ago. Um, it's doing quite well for the local community. I'm a fan of living in the neighborhood. I think that over the last five years during my residency there, it's only gotten better and I'd love to see more units come online, particularly as some of the other speakers have mentioned, affordable units. I think that's something that the Los Angeles area desperately needs. And you know, it's, um, it's a wonderful thing to have a developer who wants to do some additional things. I hear there's a proposed parking lot and they really want to work with the local school, which I think is something that you hardly see from, from people in the industry. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Gunter Prentner. I am a longtime resident in the general West Los Angeles area surrounding uh, Motor Avenue. Uh, I would strongly support that project uh, since I have never seen the 30 plus years that I've lived in this area the housing market being that tight, especially with affordable housing, not just luxury apartments, et cetera, but specifically affordable housing. I think this would help certainly the general area to, to support that. Also, some of, the, some of that area is a little bit what appears to be, call it rundown. So that project would additionally hopefully bring in additional businesses that would uh, help and support the area residences in other ways with retail and other means. Um, the developer, I have known the developer on other projects, has been a reputable and a knowledgeable developer as long as I have seen them building apartment housing. Um, and I appreciate that they're going out of their way trying to accomplish that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Derek Spencer. I'm a teacher at Palms Elementary School, and I do agree that we do need more affordable housing. I do agree that we need to have people working together with our community, with our school. I'm a lifelong uh, learner, and I've loved my community 
ever since I was born, 50 years ago. I'm a teacher, been a teacher here for 18 years, and I strongly oppose this project because there is no proof that there's been uh, something done about the uh, impact for the environment on our school site. That building is right next to our kindergarten yard. It's not a couple blocks away, it's a couple feet away. And I want to make sure that my students, my families, and my teachers are taken care of and uh, not, not just sold out for $500,000. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Wait. Hello, my name, hello, my name is Aubrey. I am 10 years old. I go to Palms Elementary. I have been going there for five years. It is a great school. I love it there. If they build the building next to our school, there will be lots of hazardous dust, loud noise, and we won't be able to learn. Also, our school has a garden which will die without sunlight because the building will be blocking it. Why aren't they doing environmental testing? Don't they care about our lives? I do not think, no, I do not want them to build the building. As a conclusion, please have empathy. How would you feel if, you were, if we were your children and if this was your community? Thank you. Um. I'm, I'm going to ask also for these committee meetings, they are formal committee meetings that um, while she was amazing and I wanted to applaud her too, um, we, 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 don't, uh, we don't applaud after the speakers. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Crystal Lord. I've been a teacher with LAUSD for 16 years. I'm also a nationally board certified teacher. And I keep hearing people that are coming here saying they're working with the community. I personally was banned from meeting with the developers and LA City Council, Paul Koretz's office. So if they were really trying to work with the teachers of the school, why was I particularly banned from the meetings and the talks? So that is not true. I keep on hearing low income housing. Out of the, the 40 units, to my knowledge, are going for close to over $2,500. None of the parents in my classroom who are hardworking citizens, they work at Target, they work around the neighborhoods in Palms and Culver City, could afford $2,500 a month. So this is not for the community. It is not, it's going to push people out of our community. And the low income housing is four units. And after 50 years, they don't have to offer the four units. So it is not low income housing. And if you could see here this picture, this is how close it is to our kindergarten yard. Please don't let us Thank get you. cancer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christian Espiritu. I'm a resident of Motor Avenue. Um, like many other people have said, not only will it create uh, affordable housing within the community, but it, as well as commercial space and new jobs. And for a commuter like me, having a metro stop within half a mile away um, to help encourage public transportation, um, as well as more sustainable use of uh, commuting um, is a big plus for me. And that's, this is why I encourage you to support this development. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lauren Bogna, and I would like to express my support for 3568 Motor Avenue Project. Um, as a resident of Motor Avenue and a healthcare professional, this is a great investment in my community. I know the project team is working with LAUSD and Palms Elementary to build the project with the children in mind. This is why they're committing to donating so much to the school and doing the bulk of the construction during the school's off season. I'm excited for the changes and the growth in my neighborhood and welcome this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leah Roque and I am a resident of, of Mulder Avenue, actually just right across the street from the elementary school. I remember when there used to just be a small little carniceria right there in the corner and it was super helpful as a commuter and as someone that just likes to walk to places around the neighborhood to explore, to have something so close by that our community is able to access. Um, I think the team has done a great job reaching out to my community, especially working with Palms Elementary School as far as the generous donation and then also using their own manual power to move, a lot, uh, to move the classrooms and to move the playground. Um, I commend the project team to ensure, I, com I commend them for using all the heavy bulk of, of the excavation um, and it'll take place during school breaks. So it won't even disrupt any classroom time. Um, I thank you for your consideration and I hope you support this project. All right, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Carlo Horado. I'm a uh, resident of the uh, West Los Angeles, and I express my support of the uh, 3568 Motor Avenue. And this project will benefit 
most of us or all of us who live and work and visit the Palms community. This project will create jobs as much needed housing in Los Angeles, including affordable units. Uh, they are committed, as they've expressed, uh, $500,000 to relocate the kindergarten playground away from the school property and relocate some of the classrooms because they believe in this community. So studies have shown that the soil is safe and the project noise levels will be below city and LAUSD thresholds, which is important to the community. Their, communi their commitment to ensure that the excavation will take place during the school winter and summer break is commendable and not disrupt school while in session. I strongly support the 3568th Avenue project and urge you to support this thank, important thank project. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Matthew Hammond, and as a student and resident of Palms, I strongly support this project. Motor Avenue is a major urban corridor, and this project is conveniently located just half a mile from Palm Station on National Boulevard. This project team has a track record of successfully bringing crucially needed housing to Los Angeles, including in affordable units and housing near transit corridors. Um, as of both a housing, housing crisis and an environmental crisis continue to ravage our city, it's important that we encourage eco-friendly developments as well as affordable housing. This is why I urge you today to support this project. This project will benefit all of us in the Palms community. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carla Garcia and I'm a parent at um, Palms. And if this project was so beneficial why are my fellow parents and students here to protest it and argue against it? Now, they say how generous $550,000 is, but my seven-year-old's life and health is priceless. So all these people who are trying to take their paltry amount really and make it seem like it's good and not tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth and how we feel about this one woman came up and doesn't understand how we could not how we reject this this building we reject it because it's not good for our children All right thank you very thank much you. i also ask um if anybody wants to come speak up here please add your name to the kiosk if your name's not on the kiosk um, to speak, then, um, then you shouldn't be speaking, so we can add it on the record. So next speaker, please. Thank you. Hi, my, my name is Carmelita Cortez. I'm a parent at Palms Elementary School. I'm here to oppose. I'm so mad at this situation. My kid's life is worth more than $500,000. All those people that are here to, that they want this building next to our school, their kids don't go to our school. It affects us, our kids, our teachers' lives. So if we, if you don't help us, who do we ask for help? What are we supposed to do? Sell our kids' health? sell our kids' life. We may not have money, but our kids, we love our kids. We love our teachers. Please right. help us. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Diana Sanabria. I'm a teacher assistant at Palms Elementary, and I'm also a Cal State LA student. I'm going to school to um, become a teacher and I'm also a cancer survivor. Um, I stand before you for not only my own health, but for the health of the students and the staff and the community that I work in. I'm totally against this project and I have not seen any environmental studies done. So I, I shouldn't be just being a cancer survivor children, the staff, do not deserve to be exposed to this and go through what I have gone through. Chemo and radiation, no, just the thought of it. I'm Hi, 
Hi, my name is Bree Donnell. I am the parent of a kindergartner at Palms Elementary. I oppose this project. Um, I want to point out that none of these people who are in favor of this project have a child at this school, not one of them. Um, I am here to speak on behalf of the special needs students at this school. My son has autism. Um, Councilman Price, I know in the past you have worked hard to help autism families have equal access. Um, the noise from this project, the, the amount of focus, the amount of effort it takes for these special needs children to focus on their classroom on a regular, uneventful day is already a struggle. This type of noise or distraction not only will interfere with their schooling, it will interfere with their health and safety, triggering meltdowns, causing elopement, which means they can run from the school or flee from the school. It has happened. This project borders the preschool of special needs children. Our three and four year old most vulnerable students are bordering this project. Please keep them in mind. My name is Sonia Salazar Savala. I am a teacher at Palms Elementary. I am a kindergarten teacher and my classroom window is straight at where the building is going to be. I oppose this. Uh, the, whoever was in, in charge of this, they started uh, doing job at the site illegally. When it was done, I didn't know that they were doing that illegally and my children couldn't take the noise. I had an autistic uh, student in my class. I have students which, that have speech problems and I couldn't even hear them to focus on what they were trying to tell me because of the noise. I'm not only concerned of the noise, I'm concerned of all of the hazardous danger that they will be inhaling, not only them, but me as well. I have a family that I have to go home to and work for and feed, and they are my children too. They are my students, but they are my children when I am at school. And I am there for their, for their safety, and I am all for their health. Right, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Monica Doby Davis. I am a 20-year teacher at Palms Elementary. It is my uh, home away from home, you, as, if you will. Um, a lot of the supporters have come up and said, you know, we need this building because it gives us affordable housing. I'm a property owner in Los Angeles. I'm a teacher, as you know. I couldn't afford to live in that building, even in the affordable unit. So think about that. I could not afford that. So let's Let's make a decision there. Another reason that this property should not be approved. As my previous uh, teacher just said, our students and our staff's health is more important than $500,000. Would you take a bet on your health for $500,000? Will you be there if I have a cancer scare in five years, 10 years? I'm gonna, I won't be able to retire for another 13, 15 years. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Gray. I'm at Conroy Commercial. I uh, completely support this project. I mean, you, right now- Did you fill out a card? I'm sorry, I didn't see your name. Jeff Gray. Yeah, we got it. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. No problem. Uh, this is what uh, the community in Los Angeles needs is more housing. Right now, there's zero housing there. There's no affordable, there's dirt lot. Uh, there will be four affordable housing units that will be about $700. I think a lot of people will be able to afford that. Um, and also they've gone out of their way to make sure it's safe environmentally. They've gone and they've committed to the excavation, which is the loudest part during the winter and the, the summertime when the children won't be there. So I su strongly support this uh, development. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Angela Alston and I have been teaching at Palms Elementary for 26 years. I am opposed to the project. They have actually not had all the studies that are required. I am afraid of the health risk for myself and my students as a result of the lack of the proper environmental studies. This, the plan of this project is not designed to be inclusive of those in the neighborhood, but to exclude them with the cost of high rent. I am definitely opposed to this. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Yolani Guzman. I'm actually an employee, a community member. My children go to that school. I completely oppose this project, uh, mainly because a lot of my fellow uh, speakers uh, previous to me has also expressed that they have uh, had cancer scares and whatnot. I'm actually one of those. Um, 
As a matter of fact, today at 11.30, I was told that I may have to do a double mastectomy and a hysterectomy. Um, I don't want people to go through that. Um, that is why I'm late, but oh, again, I don't think this, this project um, belongs with us because it's not a community um, project. It is a solo project. It's a personal money growth. Uh, we are a family. We love each other. We respect each other. And unfortunately, just like my principal has said in the past, and he reminds us every day, be at the right place at the right time doing the right thing. I'm sorry, but this project is not in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rashid Orange, and um, I, this, this, so, um, what the project is gonna do is it's gonna, it's gonna release cancer, which is gonna be bad for everyone, and then that highly, no, ultimately stands against all of my feelings, and what I, really want to do to stop it is just let them know you need to do environmental studies and then we could do to see if we agree or disagree and so i am thinking we need to just stop this project thank you are right, you can applaud that one too i mean come on <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shinkai Karzai. I am a teacher at Palms Elementary. I am a mother of two children who go to Palms Elementary. I am a resident of Palms Elementary. Uh, I'm sorry, Palms Neighborhood. And all these people that claim that they're part of the neighborhood, I have never seen them on our school site. I go to the, our neighborhood council meetings. I have not seen these people at our neighborhood council meetings. Our neighborhood council disagrees with this this project they have never disagreed with the new development but they disagree with it um, the developer has not reached out to the community we are the community the people that you see in front of you the teachers the parents the students have they had a single meeting at our school have they called us to meet with us no they have not they have tried to go all around us but to speak with us. I am completely opposed to this project because not only do I have two children, but I have hundreds of students whose lives will be impacted. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Wallach. Gentlemen, um, we support the CEQA appeal. Lee Wallach again from the Motor Avenue Improvement Association. Um, all we're asking for is something very simple, an EIR. Let's get the facts out on the table, not just days before this hearing. Um, we're, I live in that community. I know this community. Remember those, a lot of those folks that came up? I've never seen them before in my life. That pastor doesn't have a role in our community. We have numerous lawsuits. A judge has said, there's some real issues here. The PNC, the Palms Neighborhood Council, has never opposed a project before. They oppose this one, as do we. We get the need for housing. This isn't a NIMBY issue. Something will be built there. We're going to support that. This developer has lied to us on numerous occasions, has been deceitful, this is not working, all right? These are our kids, this is their help. Um, we really think that you need to think about deaf and hard of hearing kids. They're all wearing amplification devices. This is going to be a serious issue for them. We can do better in our city. We can do much better for our kids when we're citing something next to a school. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Patricia Van Dyke, and I'm an attorney with Learning Rights Law Center, and I am the director of the Environmental Justice and Education Project. Learning Rights Law Center represents many of the students and teachers at Palms Elementary, and I'm here to tell you in the clearest legal terms, this case is a hot mess. There are no guarantees that this so-called $500,000 donation will be used to mitigate any of the um, environmental hazards that have been noted. It's interesting that none of these studies were done until we sued. We have not been included in any of the discussions, so the idea that the community and the school are involved is patently false. And this is a case, we're not opposed to the project. We're certainly not opposed to low-income housing. We represent low-income 
communities. What we are opposed to is having this project done without appropriate environmental review. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Bunyai, and I have a child in Palms. I think here we should all take the time and ask ourselves, is money worth more than our children? I don't know about the other people, but when my child is sick, I feel like I'm sick. When he cannot go play or do anything, just sit at home drinking medicine, it's painful for me to see that. So please, please, if you guys can stop this, we all asking for that. You guys, your help. Please. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Deborah Breeding. I've been a teacher at Palms for 33 years, and it really is my community. I, I feel like um, those kids are mine and uh, the people in the neighborhood. I want to echo a lot of what has already been said about we didn't um, uh, hear about this, we, didn't, we weren't given any notice. The, uh, the thing about money being given to the school to mitigate, um, and they say, well, we can remove the classrooms, relocate the classroom. You can't relocate the classrooms. The, the special ed kids are mainstreamed into almost every class, if not every class, at Palms. You can't take the whole school away from where it exists. You can't relocate the classrooms. And I vehemently oppose. Um, and just give them the chance to test. Hi, I'm Brittany Dorn, and I'm a deaf and hard of hearing teacher at Palms Elementary. And Palms Elementary has a listening and spoken language DHH program, so this affects these kids even more. You'd think it wouldn't affect deaf kids because they can't hear all the noise from the construction. But all of my students wear hearing aids and cochlear implants, so everything is even louder for them. And this building and construction over the next two years is going to be loud. It, it takes a lot to build something this huge. And it's really going to affect their learning and their listening and their, their language development. Um, I have a one student who's a new listener. She just received a cochlear implant. She's hearing for the first time. She got it in December. She's hearing for the first time in her life. She hears things that she's never heard before. Like she said, what is that noise the other day? I said, that's the wind, it makes noise. But she's gonna hear these things so, so loud and it's gonna affect her so much. Even if they start in the summer, this is gonna continue for two years and affect my students and their learning. Hi, uh, my name is Molly Temple. I'm a first grade teacher at Palms Elementary School and I oppose the project. Um, I just wanna clarify one thing. This $500,000 that people are talking about, it is not a donation to Palms Elementary School. It was a deal made with LUSD. Is that money going to go straight to Palms Elementary School? I highly doubt it. It was not something that was discussed with us. That's one thing I want to clarify. Another reason I oppose is because the specific clientele that they are looking for is not, is not going to serve our school or help our school in any way. And moving classes wherever your the plan is to move them on the playground to move them to different areas has not been discussed with us it is also highly impractical similar to um, what we already talked about the mainstreaming but also it's never going to be done in time and it will affect the whole play area and learning Hi, my name is Allegra Tetro. I teach the special day program at Palms Elementary. I also have a daughter who will be in fourth grade next year at Palms. And in 2019, I hope to have a kindergartner playing on the yard right next to where the construction is planned. Uh, so this affects me on a professional level as an advocate for my students and on a personal level, uh, both for myself and for the health of my children. I don't feel that it is too much to ask to have the appropriate environmental studies done before construction is started on a building that is going to impact so many children. And I keep hearing this number, $500,000 thrown around, just doing the math, I, I'm wondering, you know, $10,000 per kid, $12,000 per kid, that doesn't make sense to me 
when we're talking about something that could impact their lifelong health. And I think that everybody here could agree that we can put the health of children first. Good afternoon. My name is John Escobar. I live actually in the neighborhood, not like some of these people out here saying that they actually live there. Um, I have my California ID that actually does say that I actually live on Keystone. Um, I don't know who can prove that but myself because I do live there. I do work at the school. I've been there for like nine years already. I'm here to actually to oppose what's going on because um, I feel more that we're about the kids, not about myself. It's not, this is not about money. This is about their health. If this is what your children at this school, if this was going on, would you guys stand up for their kids? This is my question to you guys. I feel like if we settle for nothing now, we'll settle for nothing later. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Aviv Klein, and I'm planning deputy for council member Koretz's office. Council member Koretz agrees with concerns from the parents and teachers regarding the 3568 Motor Avenue project located next door to Palms Elementary School as his number one priority is safety of the school students. Council member Koretz's office has done a number of things to alleviate many of the community's issues, including requesting that demolition and construction be delayed until school is not in session, securing voluntary funds to improve the school campus, specifically the deaf and hard of hearing students' facilities, leading discussions between the school, LAUSD, Palms Neighborhood Council, and the developer to reach a consensus to address the potential negative effects of this project. However, in reviewing this matter with professional staff from the planning department, Councilmember Koretz has come to the conclusion that there is no legal justification to grant this appeal. Furthermore, this is a state density bonus housing project that will include affordable units. If this were not approved, the property owner could build a buy right project that would only be one story shorter and not address the concerns laid out in the sequel appeal. And because the project would be by right, no hearings would be required for such a project, and it would be unlikely that there would have been any outreach by the developer to address the concerns of the community. The property owner has shown good faith in proposing voluntary measures, including construction staging, sound buffering, and donations to the school for facility improvements. It is clear that the students will have a better quality of education and facilities after this project is complete, and the good faith efforts by the property owner lead us to believe that they are willing to cooperate to address future concerns. As much as we would like nothing to be constructed next to a school, since there is no legal way to make that happen, we do not oppose the Plum Committee adopting the amended findings and rejecting the appeal. Thank you. All right, thank you. Well, based on, uh, colleagues, the public testimony both by the applicant and the appellant as well as the general public and the council office, this committee will determine then that based on the whole part of the administrative record, the project is in fact, uh, as the city attorney stated as well, exempt from CEQA pursuant to public records code section 2115.1 and find that the project is in a transit property project pursuant to PRC section 21155. We'll find the project is sustainable communities project that meets all of the requirements of the subdivisions and that one of the requirements of the subdivision find that the project also exempt pursuant to state CEQA guidelines, Article 19, Section 15304 and 15332, uh, and therefore deny the appeal. And, uh, and that'll be the order. If there's no objections, then that'll be the order. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the next items are going to be... Items 13 and 14, and we could take those together. Sure. Um, item 13 and 14, Councilman. Um, 13 is a city uh, attorney report relative to the development agreement for the project located in CD 14. Item 14 is the withdrawal of the um, application for a supplemental use district. Okay, and 14 is a receiving file and as much as the application for the sign district has been withdrawn, is that correct? Yes, Councilman. So we can go ahead and, and without objection withdraw 14. We'll go ahead and hear 13. Do we have any cards? No cards. Okay, so then on item 13 then um, we can have, do we need a, uh, we don't need a staff presentation on it. We don't have any cards here. So we should be good to go. Okay, then we'll go ahead and adopt the uh, changes in the applicant's letter and refer to the city attorney to prepare and present the development agreement and ordinance as amended. And then we'll go ahead and move that to council as well? Yes. Okay, then that'll be the order without objection.
Okay, we can go ahead and go on to item five. Item five, Councilman, this is a report from the City Planning Department. Um, it's in response to a motion uh, by Councilman Krikorian relative to on-site alcohol consumption and standards for oper uh, operational standards. Uh, the report was heard by the ad hoc job creation committee as well. Actually, you, can, you guys can all remain there for a second. Actually, I'm gonna hold that for one second, come right back to it, so don't move. Um, but I think on um, item 10, on the city attorney report and draft ordinance making technical amendments to an LAMC will be a faster item. So if we can actually take that up, I know LA uh, B Building and Safety has some technical corrections. Do they need to read those into the record? No, the, those are technical in nature. They've been submitted to the clerk and they can be incorporated into a revised city attorney ordinance. Great, then this committee then will uh, thereby request the city attorney to incorporate those into the ordinance changes to the deadline extensions as requested by LADBS. Okay, then that'll be the action by this committee without objection, that'll be the order on item 10. Now we can go back to item five. five. Good, after Sorry. Good, good afternoon, council members. Tom Rothman from the planning department joined with other members of the planning department staff. We are here to provide a report back to this committee uh, that we also gave to recently to the jobs ad hoc committee uh, from a motion that was uh, initiated back in October of last year for the planning department to uh, devise some type of system that would allow certain conditional use permits for the service and sale of alcoholic beverages to be done administratively in addition to our current conditional use process. So what we've done is we've created a ministerial process for certain types of establishments that meet about 31 standards that could be approved over the counter and very expeditiously uh, while we also would continue to have a conditional use permit process for those establishments that could not meet all of those 31 standards. So this is, in short, some type of expedited process to allow restaurants and very low intensity establishments to open up and serve alcohol without the costly time and expense required for uh, a conditional use permit. And uh, we can go into the details of our conditions and um, you know, I'll turn it over to uh, Phyllis to talk about some specifics. Good afternoon, Phyllis Nathanson, Planning Department. Um, so this is a um, just a, a, a recommendation for an administrative permit for businesses serving alcoholic beverages for on-site consumption, um, and only for those that um, comply with all the standard limitations that we are suggesting. This permit could be issued uh, in approximately two weeks for uh, a less costly amount than a normal conditional use permit. And uh, it wouldn't be subject to CEQA and it would not be appealable, but it would be limited to businesses um, that are primarily restaurants uh, that have only one operator. And uh, if the operator were, were to change, um, that would require a new permit and the operating hours would be limited to uh, between 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And these uh, restaurants would have to qualify as bona fide eating places and the kitchen would have to be open throughout their operating hours. And there would be no dancing allowed or no live entertainment, no karaoke, no hookah, no video games, uh, pool or outdoor um, music. And um, we had suggested that there be no outdoor dining if the property abuts an A or R zone. And uh, among the 31 uh, limitations are other standard conditions that we normally apply to conditional use permits that go through the conditional use process. And um, these projects would be subject to all our standard neighborhood protections. They would. Um, have to go through, they would be subject to the uh, monitoring verification inspection program and uh, repeat offenders uh, would be subject to nuisance, nuisance abatement and uh, the ABC, the Cal California State ABC would uh, retain the authority to suspend or revoke uh, an alcohol license. Okay, thank you. And um, so that means that nobody could actually play a video game that had music and hookah in it too, right? That, 
Okay. Um, before I turn it over to my colleagues for any questions, uh, we do have two members from the public, Jennifer and Alistair. If you wanted to, two of you, please come on up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Fabre, and my husband and I started McLeod Ale Brewing Company in Van Nuys. Um, we're coming up on our fourth anniversary. And uh, we were sent down here because um, we did notice that small beer manufacturer is listed as one of the types of businesses that you're trying to help with this process, and it would be so amazing. Many of our friends and ourselves, we have been through very lengthy and expensive CUP processes, and we're just mom and pop using our own money to try to start amazing breweries in Los Angeles, and it's very difficult, as you can imagine. But I just wanted to mention that there are two things that I noticed um, in the proposal, and that is no off-site sales and also a food requirement. And both of those things would make this completely useless for small beer manufacturers. So I hope that you would consider making changes to that so that you could include small breweries in this because um, we would really benefit and appreciate that very much. Thank you. Maybe, maybe Alistair can continue on with that point. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, thank you for, for hearing me. Um, yeah, I did want to shape this a little bit. And uh, my point is that um, we are opening a second location which will have food, but I mean, that is actually a rarity in the brewing industry. Um, small independent microbreweries, they don't have time or the energy or the money to establish a bona fide eating place, um, a kitchen and so forth. Um, small beer manufacturers get the privilege of having a tasting room um, which they run with the help from, uh, for the food uh, component to allow everything to be safe and balanced. Uh, food trucks are extremely common outside of the venue. And also, we are um, authorized to sell prepackaged food, snacks, peanuts, uh, beef jerky, and things like that. So, uh, but the, the food is very difficult, and that really makes it um, only applicable to a very small amount of uh, microbreweries. All right, thank you very much. Colleagues, so what we're going to do on this item, we're actually going to hold it in a committee, but are there a few things you'd like the staff to report back on in terms of what you want them to look into? Mr. Blumenfield, I know you had a couple. Yeah, I mean, it's a question or two which may dictate what we get report back, myself, but I'll try to be brief. I know we have a big agenda. <coughs> Is there a way to have a, a relief valve in place for, for certain areas, let's say if you have high concentration of crime or some something like that where, where we would have the ability to have exceptions to this administrative process? Uh, I'll just start. Uh, there's, we could certainly devise a, a variety of things. Right now we have 31 standards built in, so if you would like to have us uh, look at maybe a geography or other types of yeah, I'd like to look into that. Maybe as, that could be a standard. I, I would as, have to as a report back or, or another type of relief valve. And I know this is a little trickier. If you know, having some because I love the idea of doing this this way and getting things to happen more administratively. Uh, and I know it's difficult. You can't have a discretionary action on an administrative process as well. Because my next question is, you know, if if the council office knows of a, of a situation where we wouldn't want it to go through this process, how would we intercede? And I know that that's difficult if it's an administrative process. We can't intercede legally. However, what if it was, we kind of flip the script a little bit and say, okay, it is, it is a CUP process, but if you meet all these criteria, then you can kick into a administrative process. And one of those criteria would be that a council office has not formally objected or not, not said um, you know, that, it, that it has concerns. Because if, if that was one of the bullet points, you would never kick into the administrative process. Um, you would still be in the CUP land, and the council office would still have some say over that. Is that something that might be possible or something that you could report back on? We can report back on that. Um, you lit a light bulb in my head, but I'd have to flush out the legality of it all with the staff and city attorney. But I think we can probably do something like that. Yeah, I think it's it's a matter of. I, I know if I ask the question, can right. you can you have an exception, a discretionary council action to administrate a process? The answer would be no. So that's not the question I'm asking. Right. Um, you understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to look at it the other way, like you just right, suggested. Right. Where it's Correct. it's a it's a discretionary process that you get this shortcut, which is the administrative process, if you check off X, Y, and Z box.
but one of those boxes is uh, involves some form of proactive council discretion. Not that we would have to take any action, but if, if we did reach in because we knew as the council office that this was a problem, we could do that I'd also like to remind council members that this, the scope of this over-the-counter quick approval is limited just to restaurants, not off-site sales, not liquor stores, not gas stations. I, We're just I, putting I our get, toe in with I restaurants. I get that, and I think it would be very rare for us to be reaching in like that because most of the time this is the low-hanging fruit, and I totally get that the, the purpose of this is you, you get more staffing time to do the other issues, and it, it just it makes sense all the way around. In fact, one of my questions for the report back is, is sort of a softball in that regard, which is, you know, what is the impact this is going to have on staffing and, and how, what's the effect it will have on reviews and hearings for other projects? Because I think that's the selling point to this. And so I want to make sure that that's part of the report back as well, because that is, that is the benefits that we want to tell people. We want to be able to have that explicit in the report back so that people will know why this is important. We did cover that in the first report. Yeah, that's in our that's In our first one, in our what report. we did was take this criteria and back-tested it against our existing applications because one of the directions is to be a little more business-friendly, and we know there's a substantial cost to a conditional use permit. I think it's about 25000 And if a person had to reapply every few years, it just gets costly. By back-testing it against our existing application, uh, I, we saw about a 30%, 25 to 35% reduction in filings that would be required. So that's a substantial benefit to the business community and definitely frees up our staff. And that would that would expedite the other? It would free up a lot more time, yes. Okay, Mr. Harris, possibly, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for your report and uh, Mr. Uh, Kokorian and the, the Ad Hoc Jobs Committee that put this forward. I think it's just, this is uh, the right kind of thinking that we need uh, here in the city of Los Angeles to make business more accessible to more people and more people uh, being able to avail themselves of, of that activity. Uh, sort of piggybacking on Councilmember Blumenfeld's suggestions, I know uh, in the permanent supportive housing uh, funding uh, or HHH program, we have this provision where the applicant uh, has to get a letter of acknowledgement from the council office before the process goes forward. Uh, this seems like something, a device that we might be able to use here. Uh, so that one, we make sure council offices knows, know about it because um, I'm sure you all have thought this out, but I have a nightmare of, you know, five jack-in-a-boxes turning up with liquor licenses <laughs> overnight uh, and having to... Four jack-in-a-boxes <laughs> with liquor is enough? Okay, yeah. there's a limit. Three. Yeah, three. Um, um, so we, you know, making sure that the council offices know and that they can uh, direct that direct the activity in, in either direction. I also uh, just wonder, do we have adequate provisions in those 31 that, that I haven't looked at in many years uh, to make sure we are distinguishing between places that have a lot of children and places that don't? Uh, I don't know exactly how that be codified, but I, I trust that you all have thought that out. Um, you know, the, the I mean, literally, some restaurants have playgrounds in them. Um, it's not quite an arcade, but not the kind of place that you want to have uh, a bar at necessarily. Uh, so I, those are the the two things that I would ask is if, you know, this letter that I think everybody's familiar with uh, in the permanent supportive housing process, and then how, how do you provide uh, for what audiences are using uh, restaurants and also proximity to other outlets. Uh, as well. Uh, and just uh, last, Mr. Chair, this is not something for you all to report back on, but I just wonder, one, if they're legal implications, but two, just political and social implications. So I have a restaurant here who just went through, you know, I don't know how many years and how many thousands of dollars to get a liquor license the regular way, and then next door someone opens, opens up to them using this process. It just seems well, like that would be tricky. Well, the city is not responsible for issuing a liquor license, and those are difficult to get. Right. Um, somebody coming in, whether it's the CUP process or this over-the-counter process, would still have to deal equally with the state to get their ABC. State but I mean, our our the process that we take that we have responsibility for 
well, is costly and time consuming. So uh, currently with our CUV process, applicants are required to come back after a certain term to reestablish their authority. And if they meet the criteria in, um, in the ordinance that gets adopted, then they would be eligible to go through this administrative process instead of going through uh, the, the other process. I've got, uh, I got some concerns uh, about the recommendations, but, but right now I just want to focus on just a couple of clarifying questions, uh, if I may. Um, aside from, I'm assuming it's just the, uh, the, uh, the time factor uh, that's involved, but what's the justification for allowing administrative process to avoid a public hearing? How, how do we just, I'm oh, sorry. I know we do that on occasion. What's, what's our rationale here for just avoiding the public hearing? For avoiding the public hearing? Yeah. Well, uh, the public hearing is part of our uh, discretionary process so that, you know, we take in testimony and we hear things that are site specific. In this case, we've chosen the most applicable conditions that could be imposed on a, uh, across the board citywide. So here we've already tried to prepackage our conditions, whereas we devise them through our public hearings through the conditional use permit where public hearings are required. So. Hopefully, that we, we, if we craft this in a, in a thoughtful way uh, for, for restaurants that are very low intensity, we will not need to have a public hearing because everything should have been accounted for. And if we've missed something, we could go back later on and add to it. But the, the whole point is to streamline, uh, hasten the process, and reduce the cost. And no, I'm, I'm all for streamlining and for assisting, you know, small. Uh, Businesses. I just want to also. I just want to also protect the public to the extent we can, uh, without being overly protective. Uh, if a site is up for renewal, are past nuisances uh, taken into consideration for the approval or denial of the permit? Um, well, past infractions. That would be for when they return after yes. a year. Yes. 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 But just councilman to clarify, there is one condition that's going to be standard in these standard conditions. It's called the NVIP condition for mitigate monitoring, verification, and inspection. Even though they're getting an over-the-counter administrative approval, within a year and a half, Building and Safety will be going out there to confirm compliance with all those conditions, and we will get a report back on every one we issue. And if it doesn't happen within that year and a half, I mean, it could be two years. If they years. don't get inspected, yeah, the, yeah. we're starting that inspect inspection program hopefully next month. <laughs> we'll start initiating it. Um, it will happen. We collect a fee for it. It's a funded service. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just a matter of getting the program up and running. Okay. One of the standards for approval is that a business should not operate later than 11. How, how does the planning department come up with that? Cur that currently number? our 11 as opposed to 9 or 10? Or? Currently our uh, corner commercial ordinance, that's another over-the-counter program. In the previous years, that used to be a conditional use process for commercial developments. When they developed those standard operating hours for commercial corners, we had public hearings throughout the city. Those were the ones found generally acceptable to communities. So we're just being in compliance with the current code of those hours. Well, again, I'm, I'm uh, excited that we can move something like this forward. Uh, Mr. Chair, there are some questions we still need to kind of thresh out. Um, but I think that, uh, again, we want to always uh, keep in mind not just process something in an expeditious way for the uh, for the business small business uh, but also that we're taking into taking into consideration the realities of the community where that activity is taking place and, and doing all we can to protect uh, the children and others that may be negatively impacted by this kind of uh, legal activity thank you okay, thank you so what we'll do is um, we'll keep it here in committee report back on the two options to add those two options one from uh, Mr. Blumenfield, which will be uh, some kind of uh, uh, notification to the council office, and if the council office then would appeal it, it would trigger into a different direction, um, and what those options would be. And then the secondary one for Mr. Harris Dawson, which is actually active rather than um, just a notification that they would have to have a letter on file of acknowledgement from the council office. So if we could look at those two options and get the, and, and I would also add to that which recommendation would the department 
prefer and which one works a little easier. So those two options with perhaps recommendations. And I also asked the, the potential condition of a concentration of crime as one of the, the triggers. That right, in the mapping of, yeah, it, and if that can be added to uh, one of the conditions. I'm not sure it ha if it can and how, if it, if it can not, or if it can. Not should, but what the options would if, be. What, what are those options? Uh, Councilman, just uh, Kevin Keller, City Planning, just as a uh, functional note, we're here with a conceptual motion response. This is great to get this input. We can prepare a report back, and then we will be taking it through the actual City Planning Commission and ordinance drafting process. So happy to bring our official recommendation back at that time, but an interim, uh, some, some guidance to help the uh, Council help shape it at this early point will be in our uh, forthcoming report. So just reminding us that we'll be then going to commission and fleshing it out later, and this is all very good input for us to have. Thank you. Right. And does it make more sense to keep it and have those items come back here or go ahead and go to commission with those items and then come back here to save a step? Because it doesn't, we're going to be weighing, on, it's going to come back here anyway. So if Correct. we just add that and then send this to the whole idea of streamlining, yeah. let's streamline and let's not have it come back here. So, so no, let's go ahead and uh, not keep this here. Let's move it to CPC. And we return back with a report, answers right, these correct. questions. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense. Drafts. Right, right, right. So let's Got let's well, let's, let's actually streamline this process too. So let's send it to CPC, but add those two items and let CPC kick the tires on this and come back with their recommendations. Great. And just to clarify that, this is Lisa Weber with City Planning. Yeah. That would be with an actual draft ordinance correct. that we would take yes. through our normal uh, review process through the community through public hearings and then on to the City Planning Commission. Exactly. Makes a lot more sense. Okay, then we'll do that. Great. Thank you. That'll be the action then. All right, thank you very much. Um, item two. Do we have, uh, we do have speakers on items two, so let's go ahead and hear. Um, Item two, Councilman, there's an appeal on file. Um, it relates to a new 35 uh, foot tall single family residence project uh, in CD4. Great, okay, thank you very much. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and hear um, a quick overview, planning staff, just a quick uh, description, and then we'll go into public comment. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Nuri Cho with City Planning. The project before you is a new 2,700 square foot single family dwelling on a vacant lot in the Hollywood Land Specific Plan. On February 26, the Central Area Planning Commission denied the appeal and sustained the director's determination in approving a project permit compliance and design review with modified Exhibit A to incorporate additional architectural details. The project was determined to be categorically exempt from CEQA pursuant to Class 3, um, Category 1 for a single family dwelling and Class 32 for an infill development. The CE, the CE has been appealed by an adjacent neighbor contending that the project will have an adverse impact on historical, biological, and aesthetic resources. Planning recommends that the appeal be denied as the site is currently vacant and located approximately half a mile away from the potential historic district identified in Survey LA. The site is separated from other habitat blocks due to surrounding developments, and there are no rare or protected species on the site per the excuse biological... Me. Excuse me, Terry Kaufman, we see a city attorney's office. I think for a moment we've lost a quorum, so can we hold up until... comes back I don't uh, do, should we hold in for a minute until uh, yes we need three members okay well let's take a let's, let's go to a break Can um, staff just repeat uh, the last few minutes of what, what you said? So I actually heard it. We have speakers all over in the back as well. So we can go ahead and continue. Thank you. Sure. This is Nuri with City Planning again. Um, 
as I've mentioned, the site is separated from other habitat blocks due to surrounding developments, and there are no rare or protected species on the site per the biological resources study dated April 19, 2018. Additionally, the proposed footprint takes up only about 10% of the entire lot, which should not affect wildlife movement on the property. Lastly, the specific plan does not require a European village architectural style, as suggested by the appellant, and the project is in full compliance with the regulations in the specific plan. That, that concludes my presentation. I'll be available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Great, thank you. Then we'll go ahead and hear from the applicant. Good afternoon, Neil Brower, Jeffrey Mangles, Butler and Mitchell, representing the applicants Stephanie Savage and Michael Swisscheck. Um, what we're here for is a single family residence uh, in a single family neighborhood, in an established single family neighborhood. The director properly determined that the project complies with the criteria listed in the specific plan and on appeal, the area planning commission unanimously affirmed. Director also properly determined that the project is categorically exempt uh, from sequin. To overcome a categorical exemption, a finding needs to be made that unusual circumstances exist and that the project would have significant impacts associated with those unusual circumstances. Here, none were determined to exist. You'll hear later that unusual circumstances are alleged to exist for historic resources and for biological resources and that cumulative impacts could occur. None of those is supported by substantial evidence and the claim of cumulative impacts is speculative. Really, these attempt to relitigate the approvals that have already occurred uh, through the Director of Planning and through the Area Planning Commission. And those decisions are final and beyond appeal and not before you today. As to historic, uh, as staff mentioned, uh, there is, right now there's no historic district that involves the property itself. The property has no historic status. And in fact, appellants mislocate the nearest historic resource. It is not located next door. It is located down the block. Right now, the cul-de-sac on which the project sits has no particular status, and the specific plant, to the extent that a historic granite wall is located nearby, the specific plan only requires the maintenance of those walls as historic resources and associated with development of the historic, Holly, of the historic development of Hollywood land. The impacts also presuppose inconsistency with the specific plan, and that issue is closed and not before you. The claims of architectural uh, incompatibility also ring hollow in light of the fact that the Hollywood land area contains a wide variety of styles and interpretations and that there's no particular requirement to build a project that includes a quote unquote European village character, a, pro a term that's itself pretty vague and subject to interpretation and has been you know, over a period of a number of years. As to biological resources, there is no uh, biological quarter uh, located on the site or within which the site is located. Almost every property around the project is in fact fenced off, which prevents wildlife movement through the area. Unlike its neighbors, the project would not include fences and would only develop a portion of the site. So even with the project, animals would still be able to traverse the site around and through. Uh, there's also a citation uh, in the appeal to the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy having determined that there's some biological value to the area. That, in fact, the opposite is true. The letter they include uh, references project sites that are immediately next to Griffith Park. And the, on all the mapped biological areas and habitat corridors, the project is not included. Finally, uh, this, the claim of cumulative impacts with respect to more modern interpret or more contemporary interpretations of the European village character rings hollow as well. By appellant's own admission, there are only a mere handful of these interspersed essentially throughout the entire Hollywood land specific plan area. And a mere handful among over 100 homes, you cannot in any way meaningfully be said to alter the, historics, the historic character or the, ar the architectural character in any way that's meaningful or cognizable under CEQA, and certainly not in a way that implies that unusual circumstances exist and can be overcome here. Historic properties and historic districts are a common occurrence throughout the city. Development within them and next to them occurs all the time. Here, there is no such determination, and we ask that you affirm the decision by the Director of Planning and by the Area Planning Commission. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Now we'll go hear from the uh, applicant. I mean, I'm sorry, the appellant. 
Good afternoon, Council Members Rob Glushan uh, with Luna and Glushan for the appellant Ren Chase, as well as other neighbors. Uh, CEQA appeals to you uh, often involve difficult legal issues. Uh, no surprise to have dueling lawyers, dueling arguments, uh, which is why frequently, regardless of the final decision that is made by this committee and the full council that uh, these matters matriculate to the courts. For the limited amount of time that I have, I don't want to rehash what's in our letter to you. I do refer to it for the record. You all received it yesterday, May 21st. has all the exhibits in there that do provide substantial evidence. But instead, on this very narrow CEQA appeal, there's a unique factor here that doesn't apply to most CEQA appeals, including the one that you heard with the school just before. However creative the spin you're going to hear from staff, I want you to think about this, because you have this in your own districts. 2006, a home project on this property, this same property, planning staff determined that a CEQA exemption inappropriate. They required the applicant to go through an environmental review, which resulted in a mitigated negative declaration. Meaning, staff found that a home project on this site would likely have significant impacts, but could be mitigated through mitigation conditions. That project got resurrected again in 2008. Different case number. Surprise, surprise. What do you think planning staff did? They didn't issue a categorical exemption. They used the same MND from 2006 for the 2008 case, which, by the way, got denied. And it got denied, even though it met the point system, it got denied because of the same arguments that were made here. But what's before you today is the narrow CEQA appeal. And if an MND was required in 2006 for a single-family home project, and it was required two years later, in 2008, the site hasn't changed. The neighborhood hasn't changed. So the CEQA exemption does not apply here. It can't apply if the city's already required the MND twice. Uh, I'd like to give the remainder of my time, uh, Council Member Englander, to Ren Chase, uh, who is the appellant. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ren Chase, and as my attorney said, I am the appellate, and I would ask this uh, commission, committee, for an adequate environmental review for this project for the reasons set forth in the letters and the exhibits submitted on my behalf. Hollywood Land is one of, if not the most iconic neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Admittedly, it's very small, but it has homes that have been there for over 100 years. I own one of those homes, and on the cul-de-sac ref in reference here, there are three others. And there, there are little areas within Hollywood land where it, it's um, as if you were going back 100 years. Every weekend, hundreds of tourists and residents of Los Angeles walk through Hollyland, Hollywood land up to see the Hollywood sign. So I would, I would say that this area demands environmental review as to whether the historic and environmental nature will, will be adversely impacted by the proposed project. And I would only like to make one more comment for the record, which is that in December of last year, I contacted Jeffrey Mangles, the firm that is now representing the applicant, and uh, asked them to represent me in this litigation. And I had discussion with them concerning the circumstances of the case and my motivations for the case. Uh, the firm declined to represent me, but they are now representing the applicant, which I believe re represents an ethical conflict of interest. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of speaker cards, too. Christine O'Brien. 
followed by Rose War, Valerie O'Brien, Stephanie Savage, and Jamie Hall. Christine O'Brien, Hollywoodland. Um, planning's analysis is false. Um, I want to bring up a few points relative to the applicant. Um, they hired Mr. Cooper, and Mr. Cooper is a biologist. His write-up, uh, he also did a study in Griffith Park, and um, that 207, 2007 study brought up two issues, Lake Hollywood and the effects on, ho on the area neighborhood and the ur urban interface zone. And these are things that they did not consider in their current study. Um, in addition, they said there were no linkages. There are linkages to animals. We've proven this. And uh, the study that Mr. Cooper referenced uh, was kind of vague. We don't know if it included private property. So please, when you review their data, review it with a fine tooth comb. Thank you. Next speaker, please. If I called your name. So we had Rose, Valerie, Stephanie, Jamie. and resident of Hollywood Land, and I'm here to support the project on Logano. To my knowledge, the builder has complied with all city building codes, her permits were approved, appeals were heard, and the city gave final approval. There are many homes being built in the neighborhood just blocks away from this property under the same CEQA exemptions, and unless the city intends to overturn all those projects, buildings, they should not allow this appeal. I don't think there's anything exceptional that makes this property something that should be looked into any different than any other property that's being built near it. I ask that you deny the CEQA exemption appeal and allow a responsible and compliant builder to continue the project. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Savage, owner of the property. Uh, Mike and I have uh, 25 years of experience in the field of architecture and in mostly hillside residential construction in Los Angeles. Uh, we understand which sites require an M&D and which should receive its CE. Our vacant site is located within a well-developed residential neighborhood with a continuous paved roadway greater than 20 feet. The area is not recognized by any historical group or registry. The design doesn't need a variance and would have minimal construction impacts. Our 2,700 square foot stucco and stone house has been designed for our needs and it could have been larger by 380 square feet. It will be the smallest of all houses that abut Lugana Place and its small footprint allows for wider front and side yard setbacks and the compact foundation will reduce the amount of dirt hauling and concrete trucks. Since 2006, we are the third property owner and five DIR cases have been filed on this address. Our project was approved by planning. The other one that it was referenced by the appellant's attorney was 6,800 square feet and had 3,000 cubic yards of dirt and the MNDs were not adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Valerie O'Brien. I'm a dear, dear friend of Stephanie and Mike's, and I just want to say that they have lived in uh, my neighborhood for the past 11 years in the house that they built, and that is in, in no impact on the environment in any way. They're upstanding members of the community. I've worked on many, many uh, uh, school projects. Sc um, they're just upstanding members of the community, and I hope you vote for that. Good afternoon, Jamie Hall um, with Channel Law Group. I'm a land use and environmental attorney. I'm the president of the Laurel Canyon Association. Uh, Stephanie is also on the Laurel Canyon Association. She's on our planning and land use committee and on the neighborhood council, the Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council, and has provided extensive volunteer time on really um, important projects that have real environmental harm. Um, and this is not one of them. Um, most projects that we deal with actually are located in a designa designated habitat linkage zone. This property isn't. There's no removal of protected trees. There's not a, successes of, a successive uh, amount of known projects in the same type, of the same type in the same place. So there's no cumulative impacts here. So while I'm usually on the other side arguing that there should be an M&D in this particular case, um, I can agree that a categorical exemption is appropriate for the project, and I would ask you to deny the appeal. Great. Thank you very much. Um, having no other uh, speakers on this, um, do we have any, anyone, no one from the council office? Okay. Um, then the committee will, uh, will deny uh, this appeal.
and move forward to the full city council without objection and that'll be the order thank you uh, item nine Item nine, Councilman, this is uh, an appeal, two appeals rather, that are on file uh, relative to the EIR. It's a mixed use project and, and the various entitlements therein, 369 units uh, located in CD1. Okay, thank you. So we'll have a brief presentation from staff. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. I'm Sergio Ibarra, Planning Staff for the Sapphire Project. Case number is APCC-2015-3032 and ENV-2015-3033-EIR. Uh, the Sapphire Project was approved by the Central City Area Planning Commission on February 26, 2018 for a mixed-use development consisting of 369 residential units and 22,000 square feet of ground floor retail use. The actions taken included project permit compliance review for the Central City West specific plan, specific plan exceptions, a specific plan project permit adjustment, and a director's determination in addition to the certification of the EIR. Uh, the project was appealed and the letter of determination as well by the Carpenters Contractors Cooperation Committee on March 29, 2018 and by the applicant Sapphire Equity on March 29, 2018. <clears throat> the applicant Sapphire uh, Equity contends that Condition 15 unlawfully attempts to apply the inclusionary housing requirement of Section 11C of the Central City West Specific Plan to the project's rental units. The Carpenters Contractors Cooperation Committee uh, claim, uh, uh, appeal claims that the lead agency approved the project without any mechanism to monitor and enforce compliance with construction, safety, and labor laws. Uh, these claims are addressed in the planning staff appeal report dated May 22, 2018 and provided to you. Um, planning staff will be available for questions after the hearing. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. With that, we'll go ahead and take uh, public comment on this. Uh, David Kirsch, followed by Ryan Lederman. Ryan Kelly, and Gerald Gubaton. Uh, good afternoon, uh, council members. Uh, David Kirsch, uh, I'm the executive director of the Carpenters Contractors Cooperation Committee. We're one of the parties that appealed the project. Um, um, you know, as stated before, our, our concerns regarding the appeal were regarding uh, compliance and monitoring. Um, I'm happy to say, I mean, we've sort of reached out to uh, the developer. We've come up with a very simple one line way in regards to make sure that we can create a culture of compliance and that is by adding to the condition of the project uh, the following sentence prior to the issuance of a building permit and before entry into a contract the general contractor shall verify in writing to the department of building and safety if any project subcontractor has prior labor violations or is currently under investigation by enforcement agencies for labor violations we feel this is a very straightforward, easy way of just ensuring that we have good contractors that obey with labor and safety and construction laws. And uh, we appreciate the, the work from the developer in regards to the reps to, to making this happen and uh, also the council office. Thank you. So here's the... Yeah. Okay, we'll go ahead and give that to uh, Sergeant. He'll come get it for me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, honorable council members. My name is Ryan Lederman from DLA Piper. Uh, I'm here this afternoon um, in support of my um, a, a, the appellant, uh, Sapphire Equities. And uh, one of the principals over here, Daniel Taban, uh, is here and I'd like to uh, introduce him to speak just uh, briefly to, um, to you. Good afternoon, council members. I am Daniel Taban of Jane Enterprises a private real estate investment and development company based in downtown Los Angeles for the past 35 years. We are not land speculators nor merchant builders, rather long-term investors who take pride in the projects we design and construct. We have been working closely with the city and neighborhood since 2013 to bring high quality housing and retail to a neighborhood in transition. We understand the housing crisis is real and more market rate and affordable units are needed in our city. Still, the imposition of inclusionary housing at literally the last hour will only worsen this issue, excuse me, worsen this issue 
by removing certainty from the planning process. Thank you. Um, when we went before the Area Planning Commission, um, we got notice two hours before the hearing uh, that the city was uh, attempting to impose a, a, an inclusionary housing requirement of 15%. We had been working with the city um, for over three years on this project, and it was the very first time that we had heard um, from the city that there would be an imposition of inclusionary housing. And this is a case where there's no density bonus. And as a matter of fairness and equity, um, it just doesn't seem right. And also, it will kill the project if there is this imposition of a 15% affordable housing requirement on the project at the very last minute. I think part of the dispute happened as a result of the Palmer decision, which as many of you know, invalidated and the court treated as void um, the inclusionary housing requirement in the Central City West Pacific Plan. Um, and there has been no, um, no memoranda, no legal support provided by the city to support the imposition of a 15% uh, inclusionary housing requirement on a project. Um, and um, due to the Palmer decision, there have been at least 22 projects approved since 2009 without the imposition of inclusionary housing. Um, recently, um, the city council um, passed a motion to uh, direct um, the planning department to come up with an ordinance. I believe it will come before Plum to go ahead and address the lingering issues about the fairness and the equity. So our, our simple request, and we usually don't like to uh, appeal projects, but our simple request is to delete uh, this condition of approval um, that requires inclusionary housing just to strike it, and then hopefully we'll be before you again um, within the next few weeks uh, with regard to the follow-up to the motion um, to go ahead and address uh, the inclusionary housing on a global scale uh, for projects within the uh, Central City West Pacific Plan area. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Council Member Englander, Terry Kaufman, Macias, I'd like to just address the um, issue with the Palmer decision okay. um, that uh, Mr. Lederman was discussing. The Palmer case um, stated that and held that the um, Central City West specific plan inclusionary housing requirements were void as to that project only. The, the court ordered the city to set aside the requirement for that project, but did not order the city to set aside the ordinance. So the ordinance has been on the books all of this time. The, um, the new um, legislation that was adopted recognizes that there may have been some confusion, but it does state that it was the intent in adding a specific provision in the government code that cities can uh, require inclusionary housing for residential rental projects, that um, it's their intent to supersede the holding and dicta um, in Palmer to the extent that decision conflicts with the local jurisdiction's authority to Im impose inclusionary housing ordinances pursuant to this section. And it recognizes that that that, that case may have um, created some uncertainty, but when you look at all the documents as a, a lawyer should um, look at them, you can see that the ordinance was never overturned and it's been valid all of this time, so. Well, that clears it up. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and with that, we do have a couple of other speaker cards. Uh, Joanne. Good afternoon. My name is Joanne Dungannon, speaking on behalf of Central City Association, which represents over 400 businesses and nonprofits in Los Angeles. And we're strong advocates for more investment in downtown housing and new resources for the residents and workers who call downtown home. We support Jade Enterprise's proposed mixed use project, which would add nearly 370 much needed residential units to the housing supply in the City West neighborhood. The project will activate the street currently occupied by an office complex and parking garage by adding ground floor commercial space. Investment in this area is critical to the continued growth of downtown. Thank you for your consideration. Great, thank you. And then the last two, Ryan Kelly and Gerald Coubertin. I don't 
Gerald Sevilla, the speaker. So I'm Gerald Gubitong, Councilman Gil Sevilla's office. Um, our office would like to suggest two approaches for the committee to consider today. But first, we'd like to give just some brief context. Um, as noted, the so-called Palmer Fix Law became state law and effective in January. Um, the only place where the city of Los Angeles has a inclusionary housing requirement is within the Central City West specific plan area, which is exclusively within Council District 1. And so uh, Council Member CDO is scheduled to meet with the Director of Planning to have a more extended conversation around the Director's uh, decision to exercise uh, imposition of the requirement. Um, we also need clarity, honestly, on the legal premise. And so we haven't had the benefit of that extended conversation. And so that is scheduled to happen. In the meantime, the council member has introduced a motion seconded by council member Weizar that would look at a phased implementation approach, which mimics the approach used for the uh, affordable housing linkage fee. The idea being to allow the market and investors to adjust their pro formas in anticipation of the imposition of such a fee. And so that has been introduced. Um, finally, at the staff level, our office continues to engage the staff. There are at least eight development deals in the pipeline. And so we want to work in partnership with the city family to find a, a resolution that's mutually agreeable, legally defensible. And so having said that, we would suggest there are two approaches you may want to consider. The first is simply to act today. Uh, our office would not object to the committee's recommendation to grant the appeals. The first appeal is simply to remove the condition imposing the inclusionary housing requirement. The second appeal by the Carpenters Cooperation Committee, we do not object to that language. There appears to be consensus around uh, a, a condition which says the general contractor shall verify uh, prior labor violations by a subcontractor and submit it to the billion safety. That seems pretty innocuous. It's a disclosure approach. We would not object to that. And so one approach, of course, is to act today. We did, would not object to granting the appeals, pass it out of committee. The second approach, uh, in light of the fact that the council member is scheduled to meet with the director and we're having these ongoing conversations to clarify the legal premise of the policy, uh, simply the you held the public hearing today, hold the matter in committee. Uh, we would suggest June 12th when all parties will be present um, and to hopefully during that time frame, we will have this sort of more detailed engagement and clarity of the policy. Um, okay, well, thank you. it would be, um, since you gave us options that I would consider as the chair, um, I would, um, I would actually then go with option one, which is to grant the appeal or remove the specific language on the inclusionary element of it and add the carpenter's language to the item. And it looks like there's going to be so much more discussion on looking at the inclusionary element and the phase in that was similar to language to the linkage, which is uh, probably a good a good approach my perspective, particularly considering the other projects in the pipeline, we're going to be right back here tomorrow on those as well. So I support the council, uh, the council district's direction and where they're going. That's not an official adoption of this, um, just a personal perspective. So um, colleagues, um, if you're good with that, then we'll go ahead and move forward without objection, and that'll be the order. Great. Excellent. All righty, then with that, I think we have one item left, item six. Uh, yes, Councilman, item six is a oral uh, presentation by Building and Safety. It relates to multi multiple family complex construction. This was uh, originally stems from a motion from Councilman Blumenfield. Well, we have, um, if you want to set it up, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that'd be great. I, mean, I, know, I thought we had a building and safety coming as well, if they want to come up to the table. I assume they'll come, they'll come to the table. I just wanted to, to, yeah. to frame this a little bit. So thank you, Mr. Chair. This one has been a long time coming. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what the department and the stakeholders have to say. 
Uh, my staff and I have met with various stakeholders from all sides of this issue, um, and I want to be clear, the number one goal on this is, and, and I think needs to be the frame, which is what is the safest for the people of Los Angeles? This is first and foremost, in my mind, this is a public safety issue. Uh, we can talk about the economics of it, and that's important too, but, but it's public safety. You know, I'm concerned that, you know, we submitted this a while ago, we, did, we never got really much of a, a written report on this. What we got back was um, a report that told us what the codes are. But that doesn't really answer any of the questions that were enumerated in the motion itself. It just pushes us back to the codes. Um, and that's, that's not good enough. Um, I know the city, we haven't been shy about making the types of geological, topological, or uh, climate change uh, uh, requirements in the past, which is what's required in order for us to weigh in on these issues. Uh, for instance, I recently introduced a motion requested by DBS to make changes to require sprinklers in remodels of single family homes um, to make that more common. And you know, we didn't have a, a hesitation about doing that. We've done it in the past for shingles. We've done it for different things where we have made, there's been the state regulation, but we've, we have said that LA is unique. And when it comes to safety, we're willing to make those uh, unique findings. So as part of what I want from the department is, you know, want us to, to look at that and say, what are the findings? Why, why is this any different, the findings here that we could make versus somewhere else? you know, on these other issues. I don't think it is. I think we can make those findings if we want. Uh, and then the second threshold is is the actual questions, the questions that I enumerated um, and the questions, you know, that really come down to uh, what what the nub of the issue is in terms of in terms of safety. And this and I'm not trying to take a side on this. I'm trying to really get to the public safety issue and and, and that can be and a, a lot of it comes down to about this, this issue of, you know, a restriction on combustible construction materials. Does that make us less safe? Does that make us more safe? Both, you know, folks, stakeholders on both sides have said one or the other. We want, we want to hear from our, our experts on that. We want to hear from our experts on a number of things, which, which I, I will ask about uh, in terms of, you know, specific questions, uh, but that's, you know, that's, that's the nub of it. And, and, you know, ultimately I think I'm going to ask these questions and then, you know, Mr. Chair, my, my intention on this is, is to ask for a report back at the end of this in terms of to try to get, um, to get answers on this that are not just off the cuff, but to get some of these answers in writing. So I do have some specific questions, but I, I, I wanted to set it up unless you, in case you wanted to start out with a, a opening comment. If it's okay. Um, uh, my name is Victor Cuevas and I'm, the uh, System Bureau Chief for the Permit and Engineering Bureau. And with me is uh, Mr. Shahina Kilian, also a Assistant Bureau Chief for the uh, uh, Permit and Engineering Bureau. And to my left is Mr. Eugene Barbeau. He's our code engineer. And left of uh, Mr. Eugene Barbeau is, is Mr. Hanny Malky from the Fire Department. And um, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity. Um, we, uh, as the department, as um, uh, Council Member Blumenfeld, uh, indicated uh, we were given a set of questions back in uh, 2016 and we submitted a report um, in December and the Plum Committee um, um, after conducting um, public comment uh, forwarded that report to um, council and um, we apologize but we weren't prepared for a presentation we wanted actually uh, further direction from Council because we have had um, various meetings as you indicated with some of your staff and the um, some proponents uh, to limit the construction of wood in our city and we have um, indicated to uh, staff and to the proponents that there is a process that needs to be followed and we have not taken a position on this um, issue at all we, we want to be objective and we want to be open-minded. Um, but we also encourage, uh, with the uh, direction of the city attorney st staff, that we must follow state mandates, which require that we, if we are going to amend our local city codes, we must follow the, um, uh, the 
requirements, which is to present uh, the proper findings through, as you indicated, geologic, topographic, or climatic conditions. We have not seen um, from the proponents uh, any reports that uh, justify these changes. Uh, we cannot make changes to limit wood construction in the city uh, without um, uh, full reports that are necessary. We can't um, use news clippings and um, uh, fires that have taken place uh, during construction that did not have the proper uh, current safety factors that are required when the constructions are fully built out, like sprinklers, firewalls, um, um, fire retardant, um, various um, aspects that are required in current construction. And so when we are asked to make an ordinance or develop an ordinance, we have gone back and forth uh, giving staff and the proponents guidance as much as we can uh, with the support of the fire department that the proper findings need to be made. And so far, uh, we have not seen that uh, uh, justification. Um, and the fire department can uh, speak on their behalf if, if necessary. Kenny? Kenny Malky, Senior Fire Protection Engineer with the fire department. Um, like Mr. Cueva said, we did actually meet with your staff as well as the industry on the issues. Um, as far as the fire department and the fire code, we do recognize that there may be uh, tightening up of safeguards during construction, and that's something that we're working on with industry. We intend to have a meeting and have all stakeholders in that meeting so we can move forward with such a thing. Okay, well, I have a number of questions, Mr. Chair, but I think we may want to do public comment first. Um, senior. Yeah, we can go in the, go ahead in the public comment, sure. Um, David Kirsch. Followed by Christine Rangel, John Lawyer, Tian Pang, Larry Williams, Lauren Smith, Melanie, Tom Porter, Tom Tietz, Gloria. Um, but we actually, we'll go ahead and start and see where we end up. Okay. Uh, good afternoon again. David Kirsch, uh, Executive Director of the Carpenters Contractors Cooperation Committee. I'm here to show our very strong support for this. We think it's a great way of ensuring safety, of providing options in the industry. So I'm pr looking at this from both the point of view of sort of the labor and management from contractors and workers in, in the industry. Uh, we're very supportive and uh, just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is John Lawyer. I am. Uh, the head of advocacy for Build With Strength nationwide. Uh, the officer just handed uh, the committee some packets that I would refer to. We also have entered a video into the public file that I would encourage counsel and uh, the public to take a look at. Uh, we have responded to DBS's uh, questions on numerous occasions, and we feel that our response was met with less than a robust um, rebuttal. So there is, I believe, some, some ground to be covered there. I would also suggest that the tenets that our organization literally is talking to organizations nationwide about, and the city councils of Philadelphia, and the state of New Jersey, and the state of Maine, and the state of Massachusetts, and cities in Colorado, in Georgia, and in Mississippi, are all talking about this issue. So it's not just Los Angeles, A, B, five more seconds. I will also say that those tenants should be included in what council directs staff to look at in this issue, and we appreciate your support on this, and congratulate Councilman Blumenfield on his leadership. Thank you. Thank you. All right, my name is Larry Williams. I'm executive director of the Steel Framing Industry Association with many members in our office in Southern California and Los Angeles. Um, I would agree uh, with Council Member, Member Blumenfield that the response to the questions you posed uh, really were along the lines of it's permitted by the code, so therefore that is okay. Um, but the problem is, is that we're here because of the changes that were made in the code and the unintended consequences that we see, not just in the Da Vinci Fire, in Carson, other parts of East Hollywood, other parts of Southern California, but also across the country. Um, uh, we appreciate Councilmember Blumenfield reaching up out uh, after the Da Vinci fire 
encouraging a robust dialogue which has taken place among many stakeholders uh, and you will hear from some of them today and together we have come up with some tenets that we believe are very responsive to those questions and um, I'll just kind of conclude that the, uh, the response to the um, uh, comments by the DBS uh, submitted in December of this last year including the, the response to the three tests. I mean, Thank you. No, um, I, I really, if you okay. turn around and look behind you, there's a long line, so I want to be fair to them, too. Okay, we have responded in writing, and it is available. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, hello. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, committee, the PUM committee. Um, my name is Tian Peng. I'm the vice president of sustainability codes and standards for the National Ready Mix Concrete Association, Build with String. Um, we have many member companies here in Southern California who will be speaking as well. Uh, the height and area limitations of the building code has uh, historically been the basis for uh, fire protection in uh, our codes. Um, and the, the limitations were developed so that the fire service can extinguish the fires and uh, provide safety for the occupants and adjacent structures. Uh, but these protections uh, over the years have been traded off. And so uh, what we see is that the stringency and safety factors once present for multifamily has uh, been reduced and the tenants that were outlined uh, to reestablish those passive protections, fire walls, uh, height counting, uh, NFPA 13 sprinkler systems, fire watch uh, were proposed and hopefully the plum committee will consider. Um, by the way, so I know it's, you're going to feel that this is all slighted in short at one minute. This is the beginning of a discussion, make yeah. no mistake. This is the first opportunity to even drill down try to figure out what kind of reports are even going to be brought back. Um, so there's, this is a process. So Certainly. I know you've all, you've all been waiting here all day and, uh, and you feel like you can't finish your comments in a minute, but trust me, this will be back and you will be back. So appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Lauren Smith. I'm the senior vice president of Robertson's Ready Mix here in Southern California. I am here to express my support for council member Blumenfield's motion to encourage this committee to move forward with the critical language changes offered uh, regarding the fire safety in our community. The proposed language changes, including the use of non-combustible materials, will help reduce the spread of fire and other dangers. This will also help provide for the safety of our employees, their families, and their communities. With over 2,000 employees in Southern California and 350 of them in the LA Basin um, that live, work, and vote in this area, we feel it's a very important uh, discussion. We ask that uh, the Plum Committee uh, carefully review these uh, safety tenants and incorporate them uh, in Council Member Blumenfield's motion. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Melanie O'Regan, uh, uh, Vice President General Manager for um, Southern California Materials Division of Cal Portland. Um, here to express my support for council member Bloomingfield's motion and encourage this committee to move forward with the critical language changes offered regarding fire safety in our community. Um, Cal Portland employs 300, over 300 people in the Los Angeles Basin, has six facilities um, that support uh, building activities. And uh, we, too, support uh, Council Member Blumenfield's motion to promote fire safety. We support non-combustible construction materials. And um, we support resilient and disaster resilient materials. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee. My name is Tom Teets. I'm the executive director of the California Nevada Cement Association. I appreciate this opportunity. And I uh, want to mention that our association represents all the cement manufacturers in, in the state. And uh, both cement and concrete are very big, a big part of the market and economy here in L.A. Uh, by, by nature, our product of concrete needs to be local and, and is. And we're here to s endorse and support Council Member Bloomingfield's motion and encourage this committee to move forward with the critical language changes that have been offered regarding fire safety. We believe these changes will ensure that new mid-rise developments will be built to the strictest and safest measures 
of safety protections for the residents of Los Angeles. And we would ask that the Plum Committee direct the staff to carefully review these fire safety tenets and incorporate them into Council Member Broomfield's proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the committee. My name is Christine Rangel from the Building Industry Association. Um, so, you know, this is something we've been talking about for a while, and the Building Industry Association is trying to understand where we're going with this motion. Um, because there is no crisis with buildings flying up in flames. We do, however, have a housing crisis, so I'm just, we're just not understanding what we're talking about here. When we have thousands of people living on the street, where we have our middle class that cannot afford to live in the city of Los Angeles and they have to drive from Riverside or San Bernardino, are we really talking about pricing out wood construction? Steel and concrete is very appropriate for high rises and that's appropriate for downtown, but it's not appropriate for everything. We cannot price wood construction out of this market. Please consider that as you move forward with this motion. Thank you. Well said, thank you. Good afternoon, council members. I, my name is Stephen Wise. I'm the president of National Cement California. I'm here to support Councilman Blumenfield's measure on uh, safety, uh, fire safety in buildings here in Los Angeles. Um, we employ about uh, 700 people in Southern California and Central California, primarily the Los Angeles County where we have uh, 10 different uh, manufacturing facilities. Our product um, is locally sourced, all the raw materials are locally sourced, so we support thousands of jobs in the, uh, in the market as well. Uh, we ask that the Plum Committee staff carefully review these fire safety tenants and incorporate them in Councilmember Blumenthal's proposal. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Porter. I'm president of California Expanded Metals. Uh, we're located in the city of industry and uh, this, this afternoon I was um, listening to the very impassioned speeches from uh, Palm Elementary uh, teachers and students and parents and this is the exact project that I think uh, Councilman Blumenfield and all of us are very concerned if it's built out of combustible material. So we ask that the, the Plum Committee direct staff to carefully and quickly review these fire safety tenants and incorporate them in council members uh, Bloomfield's proposal. Thank you very much. Council members, my name is Gloria Colasso. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm the regional director for the Southern California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I came here to express my support and to encourage this committee to move forward with critical language changes regarding fire safety in our community. The proposed language and tenants had been discussed today by representatives and community industry and local agencies will ensure that new mid-rise developments are built with the strongest measures of safety protects the residents of LA. It is timely. Recently, California has been dramatic increased increases in structural fires. It is the right thing to do. A skilled workers support this this because safety is the great concern for workers across the spectrum. We owe it to the people of LA, the communities that trust our leaders that make the, the best decisions regarding something so crucial and elementary as safety and giving folks the best chance possible to withstand a fire. Thank you. Good afternoon, Rabbi Jonathan Klein with CLU, Clergy and Lay United for Economic Justice. And I just want to commend uh, uh, Council Member Bloomfield for bringing this forward, uh, recognizing that this can help us to professionalize uh, the industry with good jobs, with skilled labor, with, uh, with um, people really, uh, skills-based work uh, is really important to the city's economy. I also just say as someone who had a fire in his own home, one fire is too many, and if we can prevent the growth of, uh, you know, of, of dangerous products and combustible materials and instead use stuff that is much safer, we should be going forward. It's just a matter of safety. And so even for the um, question of housing in the future, 
We need to make sure that people know that their homes are going to be safe, that their structures are going to be safe, and that they don't have to fear fires. It was devastating to my family, and I hope you'll um, move this forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilman Ron Miller with the LA Orange County Building and Construction Trades Council. We're here in support of uh, Mr. Blumenfield's motion. And uh, I can tell you that uh, even though I represent all the construction trades, I come from the plumbing trade. Back in the early days of Los Angeles, in the early, early days before you, Mitch, uh, there was a group of plumbers that worked with the health department, because that's where the plumbing code came from, the health department. They worked to form the plumbing code for the city of Los Angeles. And, and to this day, it's a, it's a fine plumbing code. So it's uh, nothing for skilled labor to be involved in this process. We stand bef before it uh, in support of this. We want nothing but safety for our members with all the projects we have downtown. We're going to have a lot of members living downtown. We want them to live in safe dwellings, and uh, we want them to go home every night after they build them also. Thank you. Hello. My name is Bishop Mendez. I'm here to speak on behalf of Churches in Action, a coalition of over 2,000 churches in the great city of Los Angeles. I'm not alone in what I'm about to say. I'm, there's many diverse groups that this is the right thing to do. We support the safe construction standards for mid-rise buildings. We're not talking about single residences. There is a significant union support for this measure because workers across the spectrum know that working on buildings that are built on the safest way possible makes their job easier and safer from electricians to plumbers to carpenters and others. First responders also want to go home to their families. As I look at this, we need to avoid disasters. We need buildings with a foundation that is durable and practically non-combustible because their jobs depend on the safety of the construction and chances of success in saving lives. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, my name is Dennis Richardson. I'm the Western Regional Manager from the American Wood Council. I'm a civil engineer in California, been a building official for 17 years, represent the wood industry on the Fire Safety Committee for ICC, and I also served eight months embedded in the New York City Department of Buildings between the Forensic Unit and the Emergency Services Unit as part of the High Risk Construction Oversight Project. I'd like this, I'm glad that everybody's here for safety because we're here for safety also. Um, I want to emphasize a document that I've provided. Um, it refers to our recommendations from the January 17 meeting about four code changes that could be implemented. Um, since that time, there's been three more code changes. Um, we're concerned about the ordinance, although we haven't seen the exact ordinance. Uh, potentially, it will decrease construction site safety. It will allow buildings to be less energy inefficient. It will um, basically link housing costs to energy costs, and in some cases will decrease the seismic and fire performance. So I want to thank you for having this discussion and look forward to answering any questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, just let me just be clear for those of you who referenced an ordinance. There is no ordinance that's even being on the table for discussion. There's not even a report. There's not even, quite frankly, um, so it's crystal clear where everybody knows where this is at. Uh, there's not even a presentation from building and safety. This is merely a motion hearing, a discussion, um, and looking into um, a request from a council member based on the motion. That's sort of where we're at, just so everybody's clear. Um, and, uh, and so I want to kick it back over to the maker of that motion um, for what he's looking for specifically. And, um, and I'm not sure to what depth um, and if you can, if, if you, if you even know, maybe we're not sure yet into what depth, because if it is going to be a significant, um, undertaking, then I would suggest that we also, well, let's, let's see where this goes. I believe you have one more speaker. Oh, do we have another speaker? Oh, I'm sorry. One more speaker. Um, thank you, council members. Uh, Seth Jacobson with, uh, Build with Strength. Uh, I just want to reiterate two things. First of all, we're not trying to, um, uh, price out wood. In fact, Many of the tenants that um, my uh, the previous speakers have talked about, uh, non-combustible materials, NFPA of 13, uh, 
um, Firewatch, uh, all these areas that we've shared with staff, uh, we believe are in fact um, equal to and priced normally with, with uh, any normal uh, in terms of concrete and steel and wood. And in fact, we encourage the use of uh, fire treated wood. So with that, I'd like to encourage the council to look at this issue. Thank you, Councilman Englander for um, allowing that and encourage you all to look at these options and get DBS to report back. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank uh, Councilman Bluefield for his uh, work on this. I know it's been a real uh, concern. Safety is a concern for all of us. And I know he's been uh, raising this issue for the past year or so, and I appreciate his leadership on it. Um, and, and I agree. I think we need to get some more answers. Lots of questions. We need to get some more answers. Uh, and I just have a couple on, on the fire safety piece. Uh, can you clarify what materials fall under the non-combustible category? I guess that's everything but everything. What doesn't catch fire? Yeah. Just for me. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, we can stand together. Basically, um, think functionally what we're uh, trying. Actually, this is for staff at the table. For staff. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, thank you very much. But I appreciate you stepping up like that. No, but thank you very much. <laughs> eager to talk. I, I hope our building and safety uh, professionals here at the table can tell us what materials don't catch fire. Well, the code has various aspects of the type of construction and the size of the building and the number of stories on tables that um, um, uh, also, uh, just so that you know, the state of California amends the national codes and reduces the height, um, the number of stories, and the allowable areas based on use and occupancy. And so we in California build to a fraction to a fraction of what the, the national codes allow. So we are the most restrictive when it comes to these type of construction in general. But to answer your, your, your question, the um, non-combustible material is steel, concrete, uh, and masonry. Okay. Uh, the Department of uh, Building and Safety indicates that changes to our building standards are certainly good, but not necessary. Um, when and under what circumstances would these changes be deemed necessary? More fires, uh, more data, more environmental. What's what do you think the tipping point is? Well, when we amend the state codes, we have to justify that the fire in Los Angeles burns hotter than it does in Palm Springs, for example. Um, when we limit the um, uh, number of stories or the size of these um, buildings, we have to justify that we have a different situation in Los Angeles than we do in San Francisco. Um, those are the types of fa findings that we have to make uh, by state law when we make changes to our local uh, codes. How, how many buildings in the city would fall under the uh, proposed regulations? Uh, I, well, not proposed regulations, but how many buildings would you say are in the mid-rise category in our city? Mid-rise. 10 percent, 50 percent, 80 percent of them, or what's the? Yeah, the majority of the buildings, um, multifamily dwelling, are mid-rise. Mm -hmm. And uh, any idea on how many of these mid-rise projects have had fires? Um, Certainly we know about uh, well, the uh, Da Vinci, as, but... Uh, well, the Da Vinci fire was an arson, so it would have been hard to prevent. And the uh, requirements that the code uh, has in place now, as opposed to before, uh, we're not able to protect it because it was still under construction. And so the number of buildings that uh, would, if, for example, if this building, the Da Vinci Fire, if that building was fully built out, it had compartments that the code requires that isolate the fire to these areas. Uh, these two, our firewalls would have prevented the fire from spreading. It would have given anybody two hours minimum to be able to leave the building. And so um, fire sprinklers could not be activated unless uh, the building is fully enclosed and the smoke and, and fire and uh, the smoke basically activates these fire sprinklers. If the building is open, there's no way to activate the fire sprinklers. And as um, Mr. Malky indicated, we are very supportive of pursuing and um, uh, possibly uh, looking into um, implementing requirements 
during construction that could prevent even um, not only arson, but also um, accidental fires during construction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of follow up. And I think some of those were discussed in the post mortem conversations of that arson um, outcome of uh, size and scale of projects to have on site security and other measures were taken. Is that correct? That's correct. Those uh, items were evaluated, yes. And then um, going back to building materials, um, the, we had a deep dive in this committee for a number of years that actually led the effort on in what kinds of materials are approved here to utilize for building um, all the way down to uh, light switches for UL ratings, all the way. And so we, we've actually spent countless hours in this committee just on that item that I brought in trying to figure out why the city of LA has our own internal um, and contracted labs to, to create our own specifications where we don't even authorize um, things like UL uh, outside of if, it, if it's also not adopted by our specifications. Um, where the state architect, the highest approval um, uh, or the most difficult to obtain for materials is the state architect and Oshpod because they built schools and hospitals, yet we still have our own. And even if the material is on one of their lists as approval, still has to have ours. Um, so we did that, that deep dive and analyzed um, all of those differences, and it was eye-opening to me. Um, and I know this committee's changed over the years since then, and that wasn't that long ago, but we, we actually looked at a lot of that and have a lot of those reports from that. Um, so I would encourage anybody in, either in the public or even in this committee or other staff to look at where we've already spent many, many hours and had uh, numerous meetings and conversations on uh, the fact that L.A., the city of L.A. specifically, has much stricter requirements all the way down to the actual light bulb, light switch, wood, everything that is used and allowed to be used on any type of construction site in the city is far different and more restrictive and tested than any other, not only city, but government agency in the state of California, which also has the most strict in the country. Uh, and so I, I want to thank you because I know you guys worked with me really closely on in all those years that we were, uh, it was about three years I think we worked on that, um, made some, some, some modifications to it. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that as well and wanted to highlight that before we started going down the road of, of whatever this might, and, but I respect whatever conversation comes out of this and reports back come, but I know there's a lot already on file in this space, so I appreciate that. Turn it back over to the maker of the motion. Well, it's great. I mean, it's great to hear that, if, and if, if that's true that we have all these stricter standards, then it shouldn't be a big deal to look at a, at a potentially stricter standard for Los Angeles than the state in this particular instance if we do it in all these other instances. My concern here is that I asked these questions in the motion. None of the questions got answered. I was just referred back to the state code saying, well, we just look at the state code. We don't, we don't look at this stuff ourselves. And the chair is saying that, no, we do look at this stuff all the time. We break down to the light switch. Well, then why are we blinding ourselves from looking at the issues here? Other cities do it, New York, Chicago, they have their own much stricter standards. I'm not suggesting we go do adopt what they're doing. I'm suggesting we look at Los Angeles for the unique city that it is. If we're so unique in all of the materials that you're referring to, then we should have the wherewithal to look at this issue here and in terms of safety, it's about safety. And I'm hearing opponents and proponents of this idea all talk about safety, and that's my only concern. You know, and so. I think we should be able to look at them. At the very least, to be able to look at, you know, fire watch, site security requirements, building material, ID emblems, robust sprinkler systems. Those are all potential options. Um, but none of those were discussed at, in the report back as was mandated by the council when we passed this, when asking for all of these specific questions. So part of what I hope to get back is what, what we asked for two years ago, which was an answer to the questions that are enumerated in this motion. The questions about, um, you know, the, uh, you know, why does the city permit uh, large residential requirements? Why do we have a different standard for residential versus commercial? Um, 
you know, what should be the height limit, things like that for where we, we have our evaluators, you guys are the experts. We wanna, we wanna know what you think of that. And in terms of saying that the only way we can make an exception is if, you know, if we can show that fire burns hotter in Los Angeles, I find that a little disingenuous with all due respect. Um, fire burns the same anywhere and we know that and so saying that is, is rather dismissive. You know and I know that we, um, we, make, we, we look at the issues of um, topography and geography and you know, the, the, the various three findings that we have to do all the time. You guys asked me recently to do that for, um, you know, specifically to do uh, a motion that was requested by DBS to make, to require sprinklers in remodels of single family homes to make that more common. I totally agree with that. I res appreciated that request. Why is that any different than this? Maybe I'll, I'll just ask that question out front. How can you on one hand ask me to, to put forward a motion to require sprinklers <laughs> and to make those exact findings on the one hand and yet not be willing to even look at the findings over here? And I'm not trying to prejudge it. I'm just asking for the experts to look at it. Uh, hello, Councilman. Uh, yes, I do want to respond to a couple of questions that you had. First of all, I just want to make a comment that uh, it is very important uh, thing that um, the motion has done is to ask questions because before we even try to make changes to the code, I think it's important to understand what is in the code. And that's what the department attempted to do. Uh, I think the issue here uh, is more than just uh, what we're talking about. We need to separate out uh, fires during construction from fires when a building is already constructed. And also uh, the title of this today's discussion also talks about fire next to a freeway or construction next to a freeway. Those three, I think we need to separate into three different categories and we were happy to discuss all three of them separately. Now, the answers to the questions that we did report we have offered the staff, your staff, to provide additional information. Unfortunately, we haven't been asked to provide clarifications or we haven't even been told that the answers are complete. We're happy to discuss every single one of the questions that you raised as to what, where we are right now and to see whether the changes are needed. The fire sprinkler amendment that you refer to is is there because we want to close a loophole that currently exists in the code. The way that the language it says in a residential code, it says if you do a remodel, then you don't have to sprinkle the building. We have situations where they leave a fireplace or they leave uh, one piece of wall and they say they don't have to sprinkle it. We believe that doesn't meet intent of the code. That's why we submitted uh, amendment to, uh, to the ordinance uh, to correct it. That's, that was the reason but, but, for but it. But we didn't justify it by saying fire burns hotter. We justified it by saying the, the, three, the three variables that we need to Right, to and hit. the reason that we didn't is because it was clarifying what the code requirement is. So we, we basically defining what's a new building and what's a remodel. If they're keeping a fireplace to us, that's a new building. It's not a remodel. So the reason that we didn't go through all those three categories is because it's a clarification to a code and not a new code amendment. I hope this answers the question. But going back to uh, the motion, uh, I do agree uh, with the comment that was made. We do need to have a direction uh, uh, from you and uh, the uh, councilman as to what you, uh, you want uh, building and safety to do, uh, and with the help of fire department, we're happy to look into whatever path that you want us to do. We just need to get a clarification whether we're talking about construction next to a freeway, whether we're talking about construction uh, fires uh, during construction, or where, whether we're talking about wood itself being a safe material or not. Uh, the one uh, comment that I want to make regarding wood, uh, if we're saying wood is not safe, then maybe none of our houses should be made out of wood also, right? 
So why is it safe for apartments, I mean for our houses where our children and our families live and not uh, for apartments? But we're happy to have further and, and, discussions and, and go through that. I don't think anyone is saying outright, you know, wood is not safe. You know, it's obviously used in house, but there's a continuum of, of when, when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate. And just like we have a different standard for commercial buildings of a certain size versus residential buildings of a certain size, right? And there's, there's must be a reason for that, although a lot of cities don't do that. And some cities do, you know, not allow uh, combustible materials. Los Angeles does. We used to prohibit it back in 07 uh, as a state, and then the recession hit in and they changed the requirements. So it's not a, I don't know that it's a simple, you know, as simple as saying this is, this product is not safe or is safe, because it's, it's obviously a safe product for the right things. Uh, but the questions are, are to, to get at that point of what is, what is safe in terms of what is the right thing. And you, you've sort of created three different buckets you know, next to a freeway, this and that. I'm happy for you guys to divide it any way you want in terms of the response back. Uh, I just, my frustration, and, and, and you guys do a great job all around, I am frustrated with the responses on this, is that the questions are real in terms of that, that were enumerated and even that have come up since then. I mean, I, you know, the, some of the proponents, I guess you call them, uh, of, you know, asked, had a bunch of tenants that they, they brought forward, things like, um, utilize non-combustible materials, um, enhance sprinkler standards, fire watch wardens during construction, signage at the fire panel. Uh, the let, building me, let, me, let me see if I can help you land this plane oh, a little please. bit. So let, let me ask you the question. It sounds like um, there's some very specific questions that you had in your motion, right, that you wanted back to this that, that, I, that I wanted to get answers that we, okay. we, we don't okay. have answers on. But, but so, what, so what occurred in this particular process, um, since for a number of reasons, um, is that we're hearing it now, and often the reports, because they take um, many, many, many hours of a lot of staff time, um, often those aren't even moved forward until the item is first heard in committee asking for staff to report back. Um, in fact, it was just a few years ago um, that the city attorney uh, made a policy change in the city attorney's office that they would not work on an ordinance that even came out of committee as a request unless it came out of the full city council as a request to work on the ordinance. And I can't tell you how frustrating that was for every council office, and and well, let me start on that. and and but that's a whole other subject. But the whole concept, which I understand um, completely, and I understand your frustration. But the whole concept of many of these changes is just because there are so many requests to departmental staff and motions that come in, many that neither sometimes don't even see the light of day. Some that council members and others actually get their answers asked and answered even before a motion comes back to a particular committee. Um, or there's a major change in legislation, both either state or federal, that um, supersedes or usurps the even reason for writing the report. Or we find out later, for a great example, many of mine that I write and they go to public safety never see the light of day because then we find out even before we ask staff to write a report back that, oh, by the way, no, you can't do that because there's already um, a supremacy clause issue with either the state or the federal government. And so I think in an effort to save a tremendous amount of um, uh, taxpayer dollars, resources, staff time, motions will come in, staff will come to the table without a presentation or report. Um, and, um, and that's not always the case. If it's a simple slam dunk and they're sometimes we'll get a report back, but what they've done is they know that they've written that report before <laughs> and it was cut and paste and pretty easy to respond back and say here's a presentation because we already or they know it's a fait accompli because it was something we've put in the budget and they know it's coming and there's support and they it's complicated they got to get rolling on it so there's a number of reasons um, I don't I don't want you to be frustrated because that you don't have the answers from your motion and I and I want to make sure that um, as a colleague that you do get those responses because these are really important. I take these issues very seriously as, 
as it particularly pertains to uh, losing structures and fires, I lost my first house in a fire, so I, I know <laughs> what's that, what that's like. Um, I don't want to diminish it. I know there was a lot of work that's gone on um, previously in this committee in looking at those various standards that we've, we've spent a lot of time on. And so what I'm hoping to do is figure out, based on this discussion, um, and, and in fact, some reports that are so lengthy, we actually often send to budget and finance to come up with dollar amounts just to generate special studies back a report. So we've, we do those on, on a lot of occasions as well. Um, is this something you want to hold in committee, take offline and meet with the department on and figure out sort of, would that, would that I want you to be comfortable and what where I'd, you go with this. What I'd like to do is, is to, to get a report back. We can hold it in committee but ask for a report back. On the, on the questions that were answered. And as you mentioned, a lot of work has been done and some of these questions are answerable and, and I know that you guys have done the work. Um, I think on the, the previous report, we kind of got stalled at the question, of the threshold question of, well, it's a state standard. That's part of this report back is, is you know, what are the findings that we could make if we wanted to do this? And then the second question is the threshold question of what, you know, what makes sense and how do we answer some of these questions in terms of, um, what we've heard, you've heard, and I know you've met with stakeholders on both sides, and both sides on this issue. I mean, some of the stakeholders on the on the, the sort of wood side asked questions about, you know, how would limits on combustible construction affect building performance, energy, seismic, fire? Those are real questions. Can let me make questions. a recommendation then, because these are lengthy and these are very detailed. So let me let me, if I could, if I'm, I could, I'm, I'm landing it now, just in turn, and I'll no, turn it right back, I, to, which is sure to to answer those questions in a report back that we can then hear, or at least I can you know, can be put in writing. So, so here's, let me suggest this and sort of split the, the difference, if I could, because um, there's, those are voluminous um, and they're important, but they're voluminous and I could, I could see staff's eyes rolling already. With that, um, and I think they're important too, I think they're important. So with that, and I don't want to diminish it, um, could I suggest um, that you have a, we hold in committee, as suggested. We don't receive in file. We don't know in file. We don't kill it. Hold it in committee. We, um, you could, um, you have a, we, you establish an internal working group task force, if you will, conversation with DBS and maybe even some of the other principals. It's not legislatively enacted, so we're not actually going to vote and make it a Brown Act committee or anything like that, but just a suggestion that you do that. And then it come back here when you're ready um, and you've sort of narrowed down a scope of working with um, the department and bring in the general manager as well and right. loop him in and this. That, that might be my suggestion, then come back and figure out if there's a report back, what would that entail? So you can, you can really define that because, yes, and you want to weigh on. Sure, thank you. Um, actually, that's a great idea. And just to add a little bit of background, we actually have been working um, with council members of Blumenfeld's office mm -hmm. and we actually put together a matrix of what are the items that we're agreeable to. And you have mentioned some of the items that we're agreeable to. And we have no heartburn in, in getting those uh, through uh, a process that is um, also uh, has the proper buy-in from the fire department. So we do have something that we've worked uh, with your staff. And we are committed to pr you know, providing the best service as, you know, that uh, we have available to, to serve the council and the city. Uh, we just were a little bit confused as far as what report and what to do because um, when this first started, it went to uh, as an ordinance to the city attorney's office. And it got rejected by the city attorney's office um, because that's not the way that an ordinance is developed. And that's where we were brought in to work with your group and the stakeholders to then um, go back and forth as far as what we, you know, what's workable and what's not. So again, we put together a matrix, and, and Mr. Chair, maybe that is a, a uh, uh, what is your recommending, what are, you are recommending in terms of a report as far as what um, we can work on. And, um, and I don't know if we can just open the door to anything and everything on the table as far as, you know, opponents, proponents, and council staff. Okay, and yeah, now I got it. Okay, so, so if you're comfortable with that, it sounds like, um, there needs to be a little more baking in the oven um, from what I'm hearing. And I don't want to usurp the fact that I'm sitting here as chair and sitting in for Mr. Huizar and I respect um, the actual appointed chair of this committee as well. So I would be careful there. But um, 
uh, if, if you're comfortable with that um, and having, uh, trying to narrow this down a little bit and, and boil it down a little with building and safety, um, keep it in committee and come back uh, and look. Well, I'm happy to keep it in committee. I, I would like to get answers to some of the questions that I think are, you know, that we've enumerated that are threshold questions. You know, I'm sure. not asking you to come back with an ordinance. I'm asking you to, to come back with some of the, the, the key safety questions that, that we've put out there because the, that, that is the big issue here, which is what is safe. And, I, you know, again, I don't want to just defer to the state uh, because I do think we are unique as a city um, and we're unique in, in various other realms and, and this is a big deal in terms of, you know, this was motivated after the Da Vinci fire. That's why I initially put this, this forward. It was after that fire, I just it scratched my head of how that, could, how that could have happened. And I know it was arson, but still, why we didn't have the safety checks in place. Right. And so I'd like to get answers on, you know, not just have the working group, but well, again, I think, I think formulating, so this is what I would suggest, um, that we keep it here, table it for a, another meeting, um, but in the interim, um, have you folks meet uh, directly with the councilman and staff um, and figure out how to narrow that down to specifically what he's looking for. So we can, when we come back here, we can have a very specific discussion. Or maybe even, and maybe at that point, maybe it, a presentation of um, maybe that might be what comes out of this of 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 the matrix of the met metrics that you put together of what our standards are compared to others and and and, and why we're deemed um, safe in our building materials and maybe that kind of presentation by the department uh, may be a good idea. But let you guys figure that out. And, That's and, and fine. Well, I want to I want to start that meeting off with having those answers in front of us that some of the questions that we've enumerated and then have that discussion as opposed to discussing what the questions are. So you're comfortable in meeting with them and uh, yeah, having I, I, I will out. go ahead with that, although I said I, I really do want to have, you know, enumerated answers to some of these questions and not, not just have a discussion about what the, what the questions are. Right. And the questions have been written out. And you're telling me you can provide those uh, with the council office and work with them directly? Okay. So, Mr. Price, are you comfortable with that? Okay. Um, so why don't we go ahead and do that? We'll hold in committee. We'll have you guys all meet and figure out when it comes back specifically um, what the council member is looking for. So I want to make sure that he's comfortable as well. Mr. Chair, just to clarify, this was a uh, discussion item. Correct. So um, there would be no action at this time. Right. We're not going to take action at this time. Okay. So it, it's not going to indicate that the items continued. Oh, right. Because it was just a discussion item. Correct. Correct. Okay. Then that would be proper. You're right about that. Okay. Ask a follow-up question, if I may, um, Chairman. Um, will we be discussing the questions that are in a previous motion, or will we be discussing an ordinance? That well, when you guys exist? get together, you can discuss whatever you like. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, and just for the record, um, there's a clarification um, that I just wanted to make a point of that um, it actually wasn't sent to the city attorney's office for an ordinance. The city attorney did not reject writing an ordinance on this matter. It was simply for a report back to this committee and that, that's what the motion outlined. So I want to make sure that um, the city attorney, uh, it doesn't get back to them that they think Mr. Blumenfield was rejected from a motion when in fact he hadn't asked for one yet. So <laughs> I want to make sure that he doesn't get a call, phone call from the city attorney's office <laughs> when we leave here because that didn't really occur that way, but that's okay. So just for the record, okay. All right, so with that, um, do we have any, item, uh, any members for general public comment for items that were not on the agenda? One, general public comment for items that were not on the agenda? Yeah. Okay, one, okay, come on up. Dennis Richardson with American Wood Council, and I'd like to make one brief um, comment that wasn't on the agenda is uh, just to make you aware of a governor's uh, executive order that deals with uh, tall wood. And it's not the light frame tall wood, it's the mass timber tall wood. And it's something that's been um, heard by the International Code Council. They put together an ad hoc committee that worked on those regulations for two years. Um, there were 14 code changes that adopt three new types of construction, um, allowing combustible wood up to 18 stories. 
Um, those have been reviewed by their code committees and the first step of a three-prong process, um, those passed. The worst vote against them was two members of a 14-member committee. So 12 and 13 eyes out of 14 code changes. Um, it seems to have a lot of support and it's extremely um, conservative. And we would just appreciate the opportunity when there's any discussion to be included as a uh, interested right. party. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much. And our, uh, you are a final general public comment speaker, I believe? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is John Lawyer. Thank you for, your, for uh, taking the time today. I'd like to respond to what the last speaker said. It's not through the consensus process yet, A, and there's a whole lot of bites at that apple that need to be taken place before 25-story buildings out of wood be built in the city, uh, as well as New York, as well as Chicago, as well as other cities that ban wood construction, and even mid-rise, let alone high-rise construction. So I, I'd like a little... Um, common sense to be placed in in conjunction with the previous speaker's statement. Thank you. All righty. Um, thank you for that. So I certainly, we all feel better about ourselves now. All right. So that concludes this committee meeting. Thank you all for coming. We are adjourned.